You want the, you know, people, you the want, people that do wear shades. You want to sound like Obama? <laughs> you taking long pauses. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's what he do. That's what he do. Yeah, that's what he reading a teleprompter. Yeah, he, he listen, man. He might be the best public speaker ever, 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 ever. 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 Ready, wow. ready, 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 ready. I mean, yes, based on his responsibility, though. Because we had a lot of great public speakers, but like for him, carrying what he was carrying on his shoulder. Which people didn't appreciate. I'm, I, well, we could talk about that if you want, but no, I, I got my opinions you. about all that. Because <laughs> I ain't a Trump fan, but I ain't against him. I seen a lot of good come from that man. Oh, uh, you want to get into that combo? Not necessarily. I'm just saying. I'm not in the politics. Right. Obama had a scary ass pen. Mm. Trump ain't had no punk ass pen. Yeah. Cause, yeah. yeah that's what it is. Cause the time, yo, Trump gave Congress two days to negotiate. Right. Or he pushing the pen. Right. Obama waited eight years for these niggas to come up with some kind of solution. But you you understand Obama had to no, be perfect. No, no, that's the problem. We always think that. We always think that. I'm, you here for a reason. You earned this spot. Understood. Yeah, you ain't got no conditions on you. Understood. You ain't nope. restricted to nothing. That's true. All right, then. That's so true. if we go into it believing that because, you know, we're not entitled to this particular role, Mm -hmm. We're operate in that fashion. Well, no, I, I don't, but I don't think that's where I don't think that's the energy he had. I think the people wanted one thing, and the powers that be wanted something else, mm -hmm. and those so, can be in conflict for the whole run. Right. So you got four drivers driving the same car. Hmm. Four drivers driving the same car. That means no that car has the ability to reach a particular destination, depending on how a person drives. You drive slow. You know what I'm saying? Your time might be up before you get to your destination. Trump is a nigga drive fast. You know what I'm saying? He got there in four years. He ain't have nobody popping his tires. He ain't, yeah, <laughs> Putting sugar yeah. in the gas tank. Facts. Yeah. Like, Trump, Trump is- But you know why? Because he came in unapologetic. See, this is why I respect, like, I, for my I, business, no, no, and, I, and I get 50, what you're 50 saying. 50 Cent never had to compromise to be 50 Cent. Never. He came in the game, he never had to shuck and job. There's mm. a lot of artists that we, seen in our generation that were fortunate to come in the game and never have to compromise, bend, fold, mole style or skill to compromise, you know what I'm saying, to, to compromise or accommodate mainstream. Right. And they still to this day are the same individual. Would you feel like 50 at no point he didn't compromise? Nah, I think he adapted. There's a difference. I think he adapted. Now, see, if 21 I'm, questions is adapting. Yeah. If I'm on a different I'm kind of time, you know I, I point out the fact that he was empowered by a white man. Nah, we ain't gonna do that. Because I mean, if I was on a different kind of time, that's exactly what I would point out. But yeah, then but that if, white man was empowered by Dr. Dre. Then yeah, Dr. But Dre was wasn't, empowered by a white man. If you wasn't there to witness that whole transaction, you would give it all to him. If I wasn't where? The, the witness, whoever was instrumental, right? And propelling his success. The right, world, so how, how did Nas make it? But the did, world was there. Did the white man do it for Nas? <laughs> you want a credit search? You could, you could say I that. I said, hell yeah. Yeah. You want a credit shout, search? Yeah. Shout you out can't, you can't, you can't, you can't put light on Eminem because he was visible. Tommy no. Matola was there. I don't, right. I don't, right? I don't take, right. I'm not taking anything Clyde away David. from, I'm not taking anything away from anybody. Yeah. But I'm pointing out, if, if we're talking about the Barack Obama comparisons, I'm talking about the people want one thing. Powers that be want something else. And once you get in a position where you think you can act on behalf of the people, the powers that be are now fighting against you. Yeah, the powers so now, that so be. Put them there. Way more up a hill battle than you thought it was. Meanwhile, Trump, for the most part, has always represented the powers that be. He's always been that guy. That He is the powers that be. He is the lobbyist. He is the guy who's buying politicians and whining and dining with his own golf course to take people to when they want to play golf because that's where the deals get done. So he's walking in knowing the game from both sides. So he can feed his people, fool the pe fool the people while he's feeding his people, you know. Yeah, but every organization operate like that. Yeah. The mob ain't do no different. I, 
You ain't see us trying to buy no judges. Groom we don't know no some. Bro. We don't know no birth bro. some lawyers. No, you raise we, some litigators. Like mm-hmm. we didn't do that. Yeah. You were so busy trying to use that abandoned building mailbox. <laughs> our whole career, we just gonna use that building mailbox. <laughs> I, 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 I we gonna play cops and robbers our whole life. We ain't yeah. never born. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> True. And we point fingers. It's like every organization. We talking about organized, whether it's organized crime, organized power. I don't care what it is. If it's an organization, is functioning under a certain type of ideology. You know what I'm saying? Mm. What? And that ideology is the vehicle to their success. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? You can't go off of an idea, you know what I'm saying? Or, 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 or you know, title men, all kinds of things that just will that into something that makes sense. Like, nah, come on, man. You gotta, you gotta make it happen. You gotta, you gotta do the same thing that the people that's winning doing. Same thing they doing. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. They training. We don't want to train. Mm. We talk about We just want to fight. We just want to fight. We don't, we don't duck none of them. Everything right. is an argument. Right. You're on your way somewhere, you're going to stop arguing. We just want to fight. But you don't, you don't feel like Obama was the embodiment of that? I'm not against what he did, but I'll, I'll be honest with you. I feel like he did the best that he could from the <laughs> position that he was in, right? Mm-hmm. Based I on agree. the fact that, like you said, that was a very, very delicate situation that he was in. His hair literally turned snow white in, in that eight years, like yeah. in front of us. Like we watched him just, you right. know what I'm saying? So, but he handled it, like we said earlier, very right. eloquently, mm-hmm. right. very gracefully. Well, I, I got to point out, there's a saying that uh, 90% of keeping your job is making the people you work with comfortable and if i was to put that in play as far as trump and obama then that would explain why obama went eight years and trump only went four okay dig what i'm saying why do you think that happened listen man you ruffle too many feathers (laughs) (laughs) you get too hot you know what I mean? And, and, and yes, it could have been highlighted. All the good things that Trump did could have been highlighted. But unfortunately, he was making headlines for other shit that was just drowning that out. Now, Obama yeah. might have missed a few shots, but you didn't notice because everyone was just happy with him. You dig what I'm saying? We were, we were proud. Except exactly. We were proud. Exactly. We were proud. I can understand that. Right. We were proud. You know, I was yeah. proud. You know, I was proud too. Because anytime I see somebody that come from where we come from accomplish something that's deemed to be impossible, you know, you got to set aside whatever feeling or emotion you have that contradicts that accomplishment. Right. You have to really hat. accept, yeah, right. you got to tip your hat. You got to say, look, so, man. So despite it. people saying, oh, this is rigged, this is this, they was going to do this, they was going to do that, I looked at it from the perspective of, the bar is higher. My son is gonna look and be like, oh, it's possible. It's possible. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, that's the, definitely the upside. And that's, that's what I appreciated from this situation. Yeah. Not Trump. <laughs> hey, look, man, man, it's a dirty game. Like, you gotta play dirty. Yeah, and I'm not mad at that's, it. I mean, I, 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 was, I was entertained. Bro, I, I don't even prison. know who the yeah, president I is I was right prison. now. Because of Trump, it was I don't know who the president is. Who's the president, bro? You know what I'm saying? Does anybody know who the president is? Throughout the course of a day, <laughs> like you watch Trump all day in reality shows at night. Was that was, that, that was, was the like, prison Donald. TV schedule. Right. Was like, mm-hmm. Trump all day. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? And as much as people resenting him or whatever the case may be, they could not keep that mm-hmm. man name out their mouth. Couldn't. That's I said, coming genius, from the man. business that we came from, you know the nature of a hater. Right. You know what I'm saying? They on your line, you know what I'm saying? Constantly. More than you more than you anticipate. Facts. It's like, damn, you already established you don't like me. Let's go ahead and find somebody else to not like. Me. You know what I'm saying? But right. you just going not like yeah, me. It's, until, it's just going to keep going. Until I'm over. Yeah, like, facts. Until I until my demise. <laughs> I got you know facts. what I'm saying? I got I'm stuck with I got you. a couple of those on YouTube right now. Yeah. <laughs> oh boy. Yeah, yeah. We, should, yeah. we should probably start the show. Yeah. Yeah. That, we start the show now. <laughs> we should probably start. Yeah. Yeah. We, we we definitely keeping keeping that in. <laughs> yeah. Why, why in wouldn't there. we?
right, <laughs> we back <laughs> again. My expert opinion, the greatest show in the world, 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 world. See, I stole it. Yo, the, the, everybody's supposed to do it, all right? Everybody. My expert opinion, the greatest show in the world, 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 Subscribe. Hit that subscribe button because I noticed um like sixty percent of y'all still ain't subscribed. What's up with you? What are y'all doing? What are y'all doing? Just hit the subscribe button. It's free, man. Ain't nothing gonna happen to your account, man. Trust me. Hit the button. Hit the button. Meg, what up? Salute, King. What's good? Rest in peace, Tina Turner. Rest in peace, peace, Tina Turner. Queen of rock and roll, from the soul, from the soil. Epitome of black steel in the the time of chaos. That woman took everything that was aimed at her, fought through, and became an icon. She's one of the inspirations for your favorite chicks, period. 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 Across the board. Or the inspiration for your inspiration. Done deal. Rest in peace. Well-lived life. Salute the legend and the icon, Tina Turner. Moment of silence. God bless. Ah, in, in case you don't know <laughs> where Big is at, <laughs> you know what I mean? Wish my man, you know, wish him well. You know, Big has got COVID. Yeah. yeah you know, yeah. you're a big dude, but you know. Pause. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. <laughs> Not the serious topics, Dad. Not the serious <laughs> topics. But yo, just say- Get you well, say, bigger. Yeah, get well bigger. Get well bigger. Oh, rest in peace, Bill Lee. I'm sorry, Spike Lee's father passed away too. Rest in peace, Bill Lee. Rest in peace, Bill Lee. Splat. You in the building, Hoffa? Not the serious topics, Splat. Like, come on. Come on. (laughs) Nothing's off limits, bro. Nothing's off limits. (laughs) Yo, shout out to the gang gang. Shout out to the gang gang. Um... (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> Shout out to my man Blink in the building. <laughs> Blinky Blink. Yeah. Keep your eye on him. <laughs> Keep your eye on his. <laughs> Make sure all the lick is over there. <laughs> Make sure the lick is over there. All of it. Good. The whole thing. Champ, what's bopping? How was Boston? Uh, everything was extraordinary. You know what I'm saying? For First of all, I just got to shout out. Um, Yambo Boutique, I got to shout out Ayana Bean, um, my man Stack Pack, um, all the beautiful people I met out there, you know, to, to come out of the prison situation two years ago and be able to be in these type of environments where you can speak to the youth, you can plug in with politicians, visit small businesses, go to FM radio stations and let people know uh, your story right. and how you can, you know, hopefully change lives was an amazing opportunity. And I got to shout out Matt Hoffa because, you know, the opportunities wouldn't come if I wasn't on this platform. Salute. So I'm very grateful for that. So shout out to everybody in Boston. You know y'all in the top 13. Make sure y'all subscribe and everything. Thank you for all the love and salute. Yeah, salute to Boston. You know what I mean? Um, and my condolences go out to the Celtics. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that's a crazy shift right there. Bruh. That was a crazy shift. Hey, that's, that's wild. Maybe next year. That's wild. Maybe next that's year. some cold shit. Maybe that's next year. Shout, shout, out, Jimmy is shout out to Jimmy Buckets. Yeah, yeah. Shout, shout out, out to Jimmy to Buckets. Playoff Jimmy, Jimmy, man. Yeah. My God. Now tonight, I'm gonna say we got a legend in the in the, in the building. And the reason why I'm saying it's a legend, because some of y'all might not agree with me. But Open most most of y'all will. Um, as far as transitions, I know I get a lot of uh, of praise. I get you know lauded for for the, the turnaround, the growth that y'all see me go through. But I think tonight we're gonna really, you know, take a journey down a road and and see how much of a twist was taken for the betterment of not only himself but those that follow him. We got Luna. Sure. 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 Hello. I appreciate it, man. 
And I always look for interesting ways to start these. Things, right? <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know. Okay. What the hell is going on at Bad Boy, bro? <laughs> like, what's going on? All right, like, I get yeah. it. You made your decision. You're a devout Muslim. Yeah. But then Mace, he went to be a priest. And, and Sean is a rabbi as far as I, what's going on over there? Everybody like, in politics. What is it? Like, they running to God. Yeah, bro. facts. Like, what's going on, sir? I think that because of the history right. of how chaotic sometimes situation can be sometimes a bad way. I think that it's easy for people to think that Bad Boy is the response, you know, responsible for these, you know, these adverse changes. Right. But I believe that whenever a person faces some form of adversity, they start to look beyond themselves. Right. You know, they try to find refuge in places beyond themselves. Right. And I think that that happens not just at Bad Boy; it happens in the world. You know, right. it happens in the streets. It happens. Numerous situations where a person may be at their wit's end and feel like they need to look for something greater. Right. So for me, I don't think it was so much about bad boy. I think it had everything to do with the business, the music business, the lifestyle. Everything that conforms with it is something that I don't think is foreseeable when we're seeking mm -hmm. success in this business. You know, it's right. like... Like yourself, many of us, we start off like hood hot. That's a lot for us. Yeah. It's cool everybody just to come out the name. door, walk yeah. 10 blocks this way, walk 10 blocks mm -hmm. this way, everybody know you, everybody respect you, love you, right. and they rooting for you. Right. You know what I'm saying? Even if, you know, we got guys that have been doing this for like 10, 15 years and still get the same praise in their you know, in, in community right. because people just admire the fact that you're consistent, you strive, and whatever the case may be. But when we make it, we don't really plan past the porch. You don't really plan past the stoop, you know what I'm saying? Mm. So now you get propelled or hurled into something way greater, way enormous than you ever imagined, right. and that's pressure. You know, same thing with athletes. You got a guy that's playing basketball for free. You know what I'm saying? Running his toes out of his sneakers. Yeah. Then tomorrow you turn around and give him eighty million dollars, and you right. expect him to just conform to the responsibility that comes with his accomplishment. Right. You know, but that's pressure. So I think like for Sean, for myself, for Mace, I think that we all ran into that. We all ran into that that fork in the road. We had to make a decision. I'm going to continue down this path or I'm going to focus on the parts of myself that I'm losing going down this path. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Because a lot of people, I don't think they equate, you know, the loss that comes with gain. You're gaining success, you're right. gaining wealth, you're gaining all these things, but you're losing something. Right. Now you're estranged to the people that you related to the most. Exactly. So exactly. What what exactly is the 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 access once you reach that level of success? What is the environment? When I ask you to tell us what happens at Diddy's party, <laughs> when I ask him that, we just want to know like when you reach that level. What is the feeling? What is the, the everyday temptation? What is it? It's not so much about the temptation. I think just the environment itself breeds all of the things that contribute to a 24-hour repetitive cycle of sinning. Mm. Drinking, smoking, fornicating. It, 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 it's, it's the same situation no matter where you go. Right. And I think that after you achieve all the accolades that come with success, the only thing left is like the pissing contest of those five, you know, saying figureheads that made it in the Forbes. You know, you get into that. Right. But everybody didn't been to, you know, the yacht party, to this party, the Memorial Week thing. Everybody didn't, you know, bask in all of this. Right. But once you accomplish that, it's like you get you can definitely get to a state of loss. Like, do I continue doing this for the next? 10, 20, you know, 15 years or whatever the case may be, or right. at some point do I need to make some kind of pivot, you know? And I think that, speaking for myself, I felt like 
I got to a point where, like you said, it's already, you know, a serious situation to be overshadowed by such a mogul, somebody who is so impactful in the business. That's one cloud. But then you create your own, your own path, your own success. Right. So that becomes, you know, an add-on to what's already preceded. You know, and at that point, I felt like me, I was losing parts of myself. I was losing because one, I was only really, I don't want to say allowed, but I was only able to give one single impression of myself. You know what I'm saying? Right. Was the, the, the genre of music or the style of music that I was doing. I was never able to really implement multiple impressions of myself. So I was like, yo, I started to be like the wedding singer. Like this guy just needs a girl part six, part seven. It's just always revolving around the same thing. So now for someone who've already accomplished themselves in the street, I was already known, I've done, you know, I've done things that warranted me to have a certain level of success in the environment that I grew up in, but now I have to audition all over again for somebody way out in Spokane, Michigan. They don't know no better. Somebody out in Swamp Fox, Idaho, they don't know no better. No better. So it's like I'm going in reverse. You know what I'm saying? And that, you know, is something that I believe played a very significant role in some of the stresses that came from that business. And then once again, you know, being kind of like a scapegoat for Puffs, you know, characteristics or shortcomings or whatever the case may be. It's like no man should be held accountable for another man's, you know what I'm saying, right. dealings. But when you say a scapegoat, what, what, what exactly are you saying? I think that a lot of times with how people perceive Puff can easily trickle down to his artists. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Unless you get to know them, then you might find some variation. But off the rip, it's like whatever is affiliated with Puff, it just becomes like this blanket thing. Guilt by association. Yeah, guilt by association. Right. It just becomes a blanket. It's like whatever he does right, you may reap the benefit from that. But definitely whatever he does wrong. wrong. You know what I'm saying? Yes on you too. Yeah, yes right. on you too. You getting lined up. You know right. what I'm saying? So I think that was one of the things that many artists that came from that label struggle with. And another thing is like, you know, Puff is an artist. You know what I'm saying? If you think about you being an artist competing with the CEO, right? Because now if a hot beat come through, Where's it, it going ain't like first? It, yeah, where does it go first? Right, right. You know what I'm saying? And for someone who wants to remain just as relevant as his artist, you know, you have to deal with the fact that he may see something as a better fit for himself than it is for you. So was I Need a Girl yours first? No, 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 no. No, no. That song there was definitely a record that was birthed from really really exposing what most men think. It just happened to be synonymous with his situation Wait, with Jay Lowe, and I think everybody just ran with that. But at the end of the day, everything that we do or did was for the girls. Right. You know what I'm saying? You don't get money, get fly, because you need a dude. You need a dude, like, you, don't get a dude. you <laughs> right, need a girl, right. you know what I'm saying? And it's like, I think at that time, you had a lot of Hard rappers, everybody was, you know, gangsters, whether yeah, they see. was affiliated or stood oh. next to one or watched movies with them or whatever yeah. case yeah, may be. Right. It was like this overwhelming presence of that going on. So I think that coming out at the time and kind of like breaking that mold and saying something that really festers in the hearts and minds of all men is like, yo, need a girl. You're over there. Yeah. You know what I mean? And, and, and it worked. Even another record I, uh, I co-wrote on was I Don't Want to Know. You know, Mario Wine's record. You know, right. it's a big record. It's right. like, that's something that most men think. You know, you got guys out here, <laughs> yeah. know their girl, you know what I mean, might not be, be using best hundred. practices. Right. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> you know right. what I'm saying? But because of your attachment to her, it's like, I would I, rather, I just, I, I, I just I, don't, don't want to know about, about it. I've always yeah. hated that song. Yeah. I've yeah. always hated that song. Because it was, why? For the message. Because the message. I, I hated that song. <laughs> yeah, How, are you nuts? Don't sing that around. Are you nuts? What do you mean you don't want to? What the fuck is wrong yeah. with you? Like, are you serious? Yeah. Nah, you can't oh, hate man. that because that actually put the Chocolate Brothers on the map, bro. 
<laughs> chocolate brothers, you know we was losing for a minute. Yeah, the chocolate that, that put the chocolate brothers on the mat. Yeah, I, no, I, I didn't want to win that way. That was terrible. <laughs> that was a terrible mess. What did you lose? What did what did you lose? What is it? What did it cost you? What did I all mean, that access cost you? What it cost me was one, just the overwhelming demand started to gradually tear me away from my family. It was times I actually would fly in to the state that I lived in and be so overwhelmed, I have to jump on a plane and leave and not even have an opportunity to just stop by, mm -hmm. you know, and just give a hug. I miss my son learning how to ride a bike. It was, it was certain things that you never gonna get back because of the business. Right. Even though it's putting food on the table, it's making life easy for everybody, but as a father, you know what I'm saying? You're losing very valuable moments because of this. You know what I'm saying? Because of this, you know, this this opportunity is providing and, and making it, you know, uh, a, a way for the betterment of your family. Is, right. it, is, is it worth it, though? There's some fathers who would trade. You know, I I can't see you ride your bike for the first time, but I can make sure you always have a bike. Make sure you always have a house to put the bike in. Right. Yeah, a roof but to see, sleep under. at that point, you're just a provider. And I think mm. that's a role that many men, you know, kind of glorify. But the absence, you know what I'm saying, is where the real damage is done. Well, women glorify yeah. that too. Women say they want a provider. That's a lot yeah. of women. I mean, say. I mean that's, that's, I would say it's mostly uh, women driven, but. Be a provider, be a provider, be the man Listen, in the house. Not, not, be the, the not being house. able to influence or, or play a role in the development of that child is... That's key. Kids, kids so don't give... You don't need money kids for Kids don't that. care about money. No, nah, you don't need there's money for that. There's an imbalance there. Kids don't yeah, care about money. You don't need money for My kids have never complained. At my worst, they've never complained about money. It's always about, Daddy, come, oh, you here. come yeah. over. You know I mean, mean, I wasn't raised by my father. And when I did get old enough to understand... And he took, you know, at the time, because my situation with my father was very, very interesting because I was told through my younger years that a certain man was my father. Mm. And I found out later who my real biological father was. How did, how did that happen? I mean, you know, back in them days, you know, my mom's she had, you know, a relationship with my biological father who was definitely well known in the streets. And I guess he had a lot going on, you know? Right. And to, uh, I guess, avoid being perceived as a statistic, she, you know, <clears throat> leaned more towards someone who was more suitable to, you know, to more be stable. Yeah, more stable or to, you know, basically sustain a better perception of herself, you know? You got a guy that's, you know, he's known, but he's, he's, he's doing him. He's ripping the rug. Yeah, he's doing, he's doing right. him, you know what I'm saying? And the guy that I believed to be my father, you know, I yearned for his attention. I yearned for his presence and it was to no avail. Mm. And as I got older and he took a liberty to try to explain to me why he wasn't present and it was all revolved around what he didn't have financially. Mm. And I literally, my grandmother, you know, May Allah have mercy on her soul. She knew me better than anybody. Cause I was literally about to walk around the corner. I let him even take a walk with me. I was about to take him around the corner and just drop him off. Right. Cause at that point I felt like out of all these years, like that's the best you could come up come with. Up with. Like, but, yeah. but believe it or not, that's that's the plight of a lot of, of, of missing folks. I think society does that. I think society yeah. puts us in a situation where financial stability takes precedence over a man's presence, you know? Right. A man's presence, when we grew up watching Good Times, James ain't had no money, you know what I'm saying? But you ain't never seen a scene of Good Times where he wasn't in that house, right. you know yeah. what I'm saying? But he wasn't playing the role of a father. When he wasn't, you know what I'm saying, protecting, providing, you know what I'm saying? His wife was a nurturer, a cultivator, and, and that was the structure that we, you know, we, we yearn for. For, that we idolized. Yeah, we yeah. idolized that. Same thing with Even the Even though Cosmos. many of us didn't have it. Well, well, yeah. 
Bill had the bread, but he was still there. <laughs> exactly. Doing projects in the kitchen and everything. Yeah, no question. So, yeah. you know, and, and I mean, when you're growing up looking at those things and that's absent in your house, it really just, you know, it becomes a, definitely a form of trauma. But I think in our communities, we normalize it. We found workarounds for so many of these different situations that you just end up normalizing it, mm -hmm. you know, and you right. accept it, mm -hmm. you know. And then when he do decide to come through, it's like he become your homeboy now. It's like, hey, like, you know, you about to put work in his hand and all that. Like, look, man, you know, you might well get out here and get some money with me and do something like something. that. Yeah, because it's like you missed your window. Right. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. You're yeah, not, you, you, up, you're you know, not dad. Like, yeah, I didn't do did yeah, anything that's I needed yeah. to do for myself. You and, might well come out here. And yeah. that's crazy because I, I would see my pops and tell him about like shootouts and shit yeah. that I was in and just stare at his face. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. But I'll be telling him like he's my homeboy. Cause at that point, you my homeboy. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. I agree with that, bro. Like crazy. The, what you were saying about like the imbalance of like attention or chasing money. Yeah. Being present or chasing money. Like my pops not being around let me all down a whole path of destruction. Because yeah. of what I seen, the things I witnessed around me, I wanted that. I wanted him to be there. Right. Like, I didn't meet him till I was like 35. Hmm. And like you said, you missed the window. So by that point, I'm like, it was good. Like, yeah, just be, just, just be <laughs> a good really, grandfather. Yeah, you know yeah. what I mean? Like, just be a good it's grandfather. Man. The kids over there, go talk yeah. to them. Yeah, yeah. My, yeah. Pops, you know I mean? my pops was always there, but I remember, I remembered when money got funny with him, um, when his money got funny, and I remembered him. I used to see him every summer. And I, as you get older, the summers get more expensive because the stuff that entertains you as a shorty, don't entertain you as a teenager. And I remember one day he was he was in between gigs and he was trying to like get pizza. And I'll never forget the look on his face when he like peeked in his pocket and realized he didn't have it. It was either like get the pizza or do X, Y, Z, A, B, and C, one, two. And he was like, that look on his face, like, cause he couldn't give his son. I didn't even want the food anymore. Like, mm -hmm. pop, don't look like that. Like, oh my God. Yeah. That shit broke my heart. See, and I remember thinking, I'm not having kids till I don't have that right. as an issue. Like I can't do that. My father's heart was broken just because he couldn't give to me. And it's like you're saying, all I really ever wanted was him to be around. Just kicking it, it when it was good. My pops yeah. was around my whole life and never did nothing for me. He was there, lived in the house and everything. Never did nothing. Told me how to told me how to read, ride a bike, tie my shoes, nothing. Mm. Real talk. Yeah, well, wow. shit. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and that's crazy. Yeah. And that's crazy yeah, to yeah. even say. That's what I'm saying. That's why I say about yeah. normalizing trauma. Yeah. Because oh, the fact that he was dead, somebody who didn't have their father might be yeah, jealous of, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yo, look, yeah. might be ready to jump on you too. Like, dog, you yeah. complain about nothing. But in, in reality, you know what I'm saying, as we get older, we understand mm -hmm. there's variations to this trauma. Right. You know what I'm saying? I met my bi biological father at 33 years old. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And we hit it off. Mm -hmm. Because, I mean, all of the things that preceded wasn't even an issue no more. Mm -hmm. I've, 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 you know, I've done well for myself. You know what right. I mean? Right. But there's always that void. That void. Like, I was raised by my grandparents. You see my mom as I came in. That was, my mother my sister. Me and my mother, like, everybody mm. on 40th Street, 116 from back in the 70s, whatever. Everybody know Cal Hawkins, you know what I'm saying? My mother was my sister. Mm. Literally, my grandmother's my mother. Mm. You know what I mean? That's the kind of relationship I have with my mother. My mother would trick me into certain things, tell me somebody did something to her. I run down, bang, 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 whatever, whoa, whoa. And then she going in his pocket. I'm like, yo, you just made me accessory. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? It's funny now, you know what I'm saying? But, yeah, like, yeah. but back then it's yeah, like, what's Back the, then it was just crazy. like, yo, what's up with So like, yeah. just to let you know that even with my moms, one thing she never did while we was in the street was jeopardize my life. And she made a very, very, you know, terrible decision that almost cost me my life. Which was? Which was she, I was in a situation where, you know, I was doing some things for some very nefarious people I was dealing with and 
it was definitely some some loss in the, in the whole play. So for example, it's like, you know, you get a spot rocking, everything is, you know, doing what it's supposed to be doing, and next thing you know, you get hit with something that looked like chewing gum. You can't give it back. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Wow. These are power plays. Damn. You know what I mean? So now, while I'm struggling with this situation, Cal Hawkins is robbing everything that's moving. So it's like you really putting me in a deeper rut. So now when I got an answer, you know so what I'm saying, why? to this arrangement that I agreed to. Right. You know, you put me in a very awkward situation that could have been detrimental, you know what I'm saying? So I remember me and I had this conversation. I told her, I said, listen, man, you ain't never did that. Like, you've done some memorable, legendary things out here in the street that we could all laugh at when the smoke clear. But it's like this right here was something you never did. So I'm gonna make a pact with you, man. If you stop getting high, whatever the case may be, I'm gonna stop hustling. And we both been clean since. Mm. You know what I'm saying? That's for so. Since. Since. That's you know? So. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, with that being said, it's like when I look at other people's struggles within their family structure, I can always reflect on mine and have, you know, empathy for, you know, someone who may have endured something worse. You know, right. it's not the same or worse. But the thing is, like, you know, like, when does it stop, man? It's just, you know, because, like, I, I invest a lot of my time speaking to the youth. And what I find is what you said, you know, when a man is not present, you know, young men, they go on these tangents. They mm -hmm. go, they spiral, you know. Yeah. And women, by nature, don't really have the ability to fulfill both these roles, you know, because you can't be a nurturer, a cultivator, and a disciplinary all in one breath. It's like, a, you know, it's, it's a contradiction in those emotions. It's right. like nurturing and cultivating is something that's soft, warm, inviting, but the disciplinary is something that's stern, harsh, and firm. Yeah. You know, it's confusing. It's confusing. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? <clears throat> and those roles have to be shared. So, you know, being able to identify with trauma. It's something that I attribute to trying to reach a lot of the youth out here. Because all these problems start at home. All, of them. all these problems start at home, you know? And, you know. What do you think, what do you think would, would, uh, would change things indefinitely? I got one suggestion. I want to hear your suggestion first. I'm going to tell you what I think. <laughs> when, it, when a kid gets charged, his parents do too. Hmm. That might be a little harsh. But I just did, I, I, I just I just came from doing nine years for a conspiracy that had very, very little to do with me. Right, but that's as a grown man. I'm talking about, you know, the, the young boys that's running around out here and they're getting into shit. And you know the reason they're getting into shit is because it's somebody in the household not you know what I mean? I don't know about that. I don't know about that. No, 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 no. I'm I'm not saying it's perfect. No, 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 no. Because no. <laughs> there's a lot of situations that can make that, you know, just not really justify, but explain why that condition even exists. But I think parents would take it a little bit more seriously. Uh, on a case by case basis, I can see how that would work. On yeah. a case by case, case by case. Yeah. Right. I'm thinking of the parents who are busting their ass and not home. And not home. Right. Now they get charged, they lose their jobs. <laughs> Now everybody in the house fucked up. Yeah. Mom, every, every, everybody fucked up. Yeah, that's what I'm saying. It's like, it's certain things that's already put in place that's a trap. Yeah. And that's why I say, you know, on paper that sounds good. Mm -hmm. You know, but, and I, and I mention this a lot to a lot of communities I talk to. Because I speak to a lot of Muslim youth, non-Muslim youth, but just to give you an example, a lot of the Muslim youth, they're born and raised Muslim. Majority of them. I can give a talk and say by show of hands, how many of you born and raised Muslim? 98% of them raised their hand. Right. How many of y'all was raised with both of y'all parents? And all? Maybe 90 some percent raised their hand. So at that point, I'm allowing them to see visually that you have very limited excuse. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? You have very limited excuse because you come from structure.
Now, the flip side of that is the environment that we know. Right. You know what I'm saying? So even if that structure is put in place the way we know it to be, father working, mom's working, literally, a child may spend eight hours a month corresponding with their parents under those conditions. Because you out eight hours. Right. Mom's out eight hours working. You in school eight hours. Right. If y'all not having dinner at the table, y'all probably just walking past each other so, in the house. You know what I'm point. saying? So there's no real correspondence that takes place in the house. There's no, you know what I'm saying, random lessons being given by a father. I mean, come here, man. Sit down for a minute, man. I want to talk to you about something. Those things don't really exist because the stress and strife that comes with the demand to maintain financial stability in the home, it just overrides all of the other things that are true necessities. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. and, and trying to find balance in that, in some cases, is impossible. Yeah, you just plug, you know plug in holes in a leaky boat. Yeah, Especially so now, with technology, it's not going to work. Yeah, yeah now technology so is like, too. yeah, yeah technology. That's a new parent. Yeah, technology is another set of parents. Right. So now you're competing with another set of parents. Right. You know what I mean? Speaking of parents, just to spin back, did you ever squash things with your other dad? Um, the one you was about to take around the corner? No, he died. He died. Mm -hmm. You know, I went to the funeral, paid my respects, whatever the case may be. And I never got the really, I never got real closure. And I think that, you know, my grandmother, she told me he was hurt. But at that time, cause my grandmother was a different type of breed. You know, she comes from a different generation. They can find empathy in everything. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? But when you're a child that's been carrying this burden, and even though it's been sufficed by the presence of my grandparents, it still can't be undone, you know? So in that moment, I felt like, you know, he missed his opportunity. And he actually requested to see me on his deathbed, and I didn't go. And for a long time, I used to, you know, wonder like Why? what he would have said, you know what I'm saying? Why? What he would have, you know, Why what, didn't you what go? effort would he put forth? Why didn't you go? To be honest with you, I didn't feel he deserved it. Mm. I didn't feel he deserved it. At the time? At the time. His perspective changed, though, mm -hmm. since then. Your perspective changed. Oh, absolutely. Changed. I mean, yeah. now I understand the rights of a father. You mm -hmm. know what I'm saying? Right. Through Islam, I understand that a father's rights is never relinquished. Right. You know what right. I'm saying? I didn't have that understanding before. I had anger. And, and his crime was working too much? Like, not being around you? Nah, he wasn't working. He was... He was, he was he was in the trenches. He was doing him. You I'm not saying? talking about your biological. Oh, well, which which one was you gonna drop off around the corner? Was that the biological no, or the one who raised you? No, neither one of them raised me. But you know what I mean. The one yeah, your mother well, told you. The one you that was. I assumed to be my dad. He was the one that I had a heightened sense of resentment for. Mm. Yeah, because it's, it's yeah, absolute. I mean to yeah. this day I can still yeah. remember standing by the door in the whole one piece snowsuit with the snap on mitts, just standing there waiting. Burning up, sweating. Mm. Grandmother like, you know, why don't you just take it? To, no, we coming. I remember this stuff. Mm. This yeah. stuff never goes nowhere. You know Sitting on the stoop. Yeah. So it's like, I honestly at the time didn't think he deserved it. Mm. Did I have some regrets? Yeah, because I probably wanted to hear what he had to what say, had but to I say. just didn't think he deserved it. It mm. could have been anything. Could have been, a, 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 you know, a genuine apology. Or could have been, yo, take 10 paces, turn right, dig right there. You know, I don't know what it could have been. <laughs> right, you know what I'm saying? Right, right, right. But at the time, I didn't feel like he deserved it. You know, and like I said, as I got older and finding out at the end of it all, he wasn't really my father. Mm. It wasn't really a Did he know that? Huh? Did he know that? I'm sure he did. Mm. I'm sure he did. Could that, that have been the reason? Could that have been the reason for the the divide? I mean, it could have been, man. Cal Hogan's is a piece of work, man. It's like you know, <laughs> Cal Hogan, she has she has she has a way, man, where you know, she can bring the best out you, you know, the worst out you, you know. How did you yeah. find out though? Was it any type of blood test? 
Nah, wasn't no blood test. Wasn't no blood test. But I mean, it was something that was always known. I come from a family that they are experts at keeping secrets. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And I think that that's Even something. Even from each other. Yeah, I think that's something that also contributes to a lot of our trauma. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? definitely, I agree with the that. withholding of the certain withholding things. Withholding of information, that, yeah, 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 information that you know could definitely help us, you know, assess things better. You know, if we only knew. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That that wasn't your father. If you didn't know anything, that earlier. Anything. I'm always learning something late. <laughs> I'm always like, because I mean, my family knew me growing up to be very. Um, I lacked a lot of control over my emotions when I was younger, you know. Is that how you got the name Lou? Definitely, definitely yeah. contribute to that, definitely. But mostly because I got the name out of California. You know what I'm saying I moved to California in like '89, right. and I think just me conducting myself like a New York kid was just different. It was, it was, it was contrary to what they understood, right. and that's what kind of put me in a position where I was always being told I was out of pocket. Now, now, okay, California, you were living with your uncle. How did you even get to the point where you had to make that move? Well, actually, George Jackson was my godfather. Godfather. You know yeah, his okay. mother yeah. and my grandmother were best friends. They yeah. actually swiped kids. Like, my grandmother gave my mother to my Aunt Henny, and my Aunt Henny gave George to my grandmother. And they, like, they both played you know, very defining roles Whoa. in their lives, separately and apart, you know what I'm right. saying? So George actually graduated from Harvard, you know, he was a well-known film producer. He produced a lot of uh, uh, movies that impacted our culture, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? Crush Groove was the first, Oof. which was the promotional vehicle for Def Jam Records, you right. know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? New Jack City. Was New Jack that. City, Disorderly, you yeah. know what I'm saying? JoJo Dance, and House Party 2, he had the Eddie and Malcolm show, the first mm -hmm. version of Beauty Salon, I mean, Beauty Shop. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, no, no, that was, that the, was the remake. The first one was with Phyllis Stickney. The mm. one that played um, the lawyer in um, New Jack City. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Ms. Hawkins. That's yeah. my last name. Wow. You know and so basically. Yeah. <laughs> 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 the look yeah. in the scuffle. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right. So, you know, basically, George always, you know what I'm saying? That's cool. You know, he always. Yo, lock the door. Lock the door. Lock the door. Yeah. 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 Basically, you know, George was my father figure. You know, George was the man that was there. Being from the age range of what would be a biological father's age. You know, my grandfather was my father, hands down. That was the man that raised me. You know, but George was always there, always on time, always, you know, I tried to follow him. Every school he went to, I tried to go to. I tried to emulate him in every way I could. But what led to me going to California, because I used to fight a lot, you know what I'm saying? Like growing up in Harlem, you know, I fought maybe 75% of my friends. That's how we became friends, you know what I'm saying? It's, you know, we always had that, you know, that 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 doubt. Mm -hmm. And then just randomly one day, I think you did, you would beat me. Like, you know, it just, it just come out, <laughs> and next thing you know, y'all bump, and then y'all tight, right. you know? And then when, you know, something jump off, you know who to go get. Right. Because I seen your work. Yeah, facts. I'm not doing, he talk all the time. I ain't no. never seen him do that. You love him. I bump with him. I know he go. So I'm going to go, yo, hey, yo, come outside. Come out for what? What you trying to do? Like, nah, I ain't that. I need to do that. <laughs> <laughs> I need to do that. There's something else. Right, you know right, what I'm right. saying? <laughs> so my family was used to me always getting in the scuffles. But on a particular night, somebody got shot. Hmm. And that was a game changer, you know what I'm saying? So by my grandmother hearing about that, I became the original Fresh Prince. It was like, you gotta you're go. going out there with George. Yeah. Well, actually he suggested it. You just send him out here with me, you mm. know? He was really at a turning point in his career. So for him to take that responsibility, that was big because I still was a very at-risk youth. I was, I was still like- High-headed. Yeah, I was high-headed. So like I got out there and everything I used to do, I'm out there punching people in the mouth and all that. And like this ain't that. Hey, 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 this ain't New York. That's what I used to hear. Hey, hey homie, this ain't New York. You can't be doing that. 
hey, somebody gonna bomb on you, New York. Somebody gonna smoke you, New York. I kept hearing, like, well, smoke me for what? I'm only doing what kids do in New York. Right. Mm. But culturally, I was out of pocket. pocket. You know what I'm saying? So it started turning into, hey, homie, you loony, cuz you can't be out here doing that, homie. Like, this ain't New York. You need somebody to kill you, homie. Like, and it's like, it started getting to a tone that was like, this is really an issue. Right? Yeah, yeah. Because <laughs> yeah. yeah. you know, at first we always, you, you know. You're getting the warning too much. Yeah, because like. New York, we always process something like hate. Everything is like, yo, come on, I hate. Trying to play yeah, you know what I'm trying to play? Like, you hating like whatever. Well, but it's like, it started, the tone started to shift to me. It was like, this like, is a real We worried sit-down. about you. Like, yeah, we yeah. really having a round table right now about this. You know what this saying? is an intervention. Yeah, this is an intervention. Yeah, you know, so, and that's what really shaped it. And honestly, I didn't really change. No, it, 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 it didn't change. It just, it became acceptable now because y'all put a label on it. It's like, okay, that's what I'm doing. He's the crazy kid. Yeah. yeah. All right, I'm going to be alone then. Yeah. Then you start yeah. a fitness business where you was teaching people how to fight? Huh? Then you start a um, fitness business where you was teaching people how to fight? No, 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 no. I never trained nobody to fight. I never trained nobody to fight. I just, I actually trained when I was young. Mm-hmm. But most of it was being in the street, in the street, street fighter. Yeah. So I kind of grew up with an advantage. Right. So you know, the average dude in the street ain't got no jab. Right. Right handed, they fight with their right leg out, they winding up, they, you know, they just sort of, you know, one haymaker is over. You know what I mean? Right. I'm going to give three. Right. <laughs> one Hail Mary you want to throw, you know what I'm saying? Bing, right. Yeah. And, you yeah. Under, and when you understand that, you know, it actually, makes you the opposite of a bully. Yeah. Because I always think bullies operate off of what they lack. Right. You know what I'm saying? They operate off of what they lack. Mm. A dude that knows something, you know what I mean? He's trying to find a workaround. He's trying to find a way to avoid the avoid situation. The, the then issue. all else right. fell, like, come on, you signed right. up come for on, this. Now, yeah. now I could do what I need to do, no. go to sleep, my thumb in my mouth, not a worry in the world, because right. it's like I've exhausted every, you know what I'm saying, possibility to, to avoid the situation. Right. That you were requesting. Yeah, because yeah. I'm studying your whole anatomy. I'm looking at you like, I, I know this thing. Oh, this ain't it. Yeah, this ain't what yeah, you're trying to do, man. Yeah. Yeah, leave, me, leave, leave me alone. Sometimes you just do, you know, yeah. you know, you repeat stuff your grandmother told you. My grandmother told me if somebody hit me, hit them back. Mm-hmm. You know, mm-hmm. that's when you know you start, like, you really, like, you fronting with it now. Like, right. Was there any, was there any opportunities that. presented to you while you was out there in L.A.? Being that, you know, George Jackson had that influence? Nah, George, literally, be honest with you, George was film school. I never aspired to be in the music business. I never really cared for it, to be honest with you. Like, Crush Groove, to me, was fascinating because George produced it. Meeting Russell Simmons at 10 years old, and LL, you know, and all them. And I, it was it was cool. You know, I, I, I was more of a Beat Street fan. I, I like the break dancing and all of that, you know. You used to break dance, huh? Nah, I don't even. You know what's funny? Soon as I learned how to windmill, it went out of step. <laughs> as soon as I learned, like, finally, like, He's doing that at the parties and people was walking away, like, come on, man, we're not doing that no more. Dude, wow. Nah, break dancing was like battle rap. Wasn't no girls around. Yeah. And if they was, they were sprinkled. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because you know how it is. Especially you, mm. you know. Battle rap can get yeah, yeah messy. It can get tri- yeah, it can get messy. It can, you know get, it can get viral. Yeah. So we, can, viral. we going we going down there. We got you as a kid dealing with things as far as your mom was concerned. Basically, born in the streets. There's that whole Nikki Barnes connection mm-hmm. that that you don't speak about, but so often. But um, I like the we. I, I want to keep going on the. The path the on the way up right. to, to the music. Like, yeah, yeah. Okay. So, so we got you, the Fresh Prince of Bel Air, for real, for real. Beverly <laughs> <Bentley> Hills. Beverly <laughs> Hills. Bel Air is another tax break. Right. right. <laughs> <laughs> you avoided any Nicki Barnes. You avoided the streets. You, you would think that with a Nicki Barnes connection, you could just, hey, my ticket is paved. I can, my ticket's punched. I can do whatever I want. I go work that, for that organization and, and be good money. Well. He he actually fell when I was a baby. I'm but I'm sure yeah. they were remnant people were around. You, well, my father Jazz was really the one that you know came out of all of that. Mm-hmm. 
with you know still his stripes and bars in order. Right. You know what Nick did. You know, put a black eye on everything, everything. that he might have did that, that contributed to you know right. some the, good at the time. Right. And that's the thing. You know, it is in the street. We hold each other to a very high standard. We you know our expectations is sometimes oppressive. So mm. somebody meets you at seven, they show up at seven oh two. It's like he out of pocket. Like, yo, no, are you serious? Right. You know what I mean? It's like we would put standards on each other that was oppressive. Un unrealistic. Unrealistic, man. You know, and it would justify whatever we felt was like, necessary to do. And that's not real. Right. You know, that's, that's not real, man. But just to add to what you were saying. You know, all of these things contributed to what later became a career in the music business. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because I had so much trouble in school that I actually had to go get therapy. This was a condition for me to go to public school, not private school, like just to go back to public school to avoid going to special ed. The special ed was for behavior. Some, a lot of people think special ed was because you was deficient in academics. Nah, special ed was also a place for behavior issues. Yes, yeah, right. You know, so that was something that my family never wanted from me. You know what I'm saying? Never mm -hmm. wanted from me. And basically the condition was I had to go to therapy. So for four years, every Monday and Thursday, I had to go up to City College and have therapy sessions. And it benefited me tremendously. What'd you learn in there? I found my voice. You know what I'm saying? Mm. Because like I said, like being young, I didn't have an intimidating voice. You know what I'm saying? I could say all the slick stuff in the world, invite you to my privacy. They just probably just never really moved the needle. Landed, right. Yeah, I had to go. You know what I'm saying? It, it makes some stick. Right. But the fact that I didn't know how to express myself when I was at those, you know, these, these emotional peaks, you know, those uncontrollable spurts, you know what I'm saying? Like, I didn't know how to make sense of all of that stuff. So having someone kind of walk you down or walk those, that process down. Walk you through it. Yeah. yeah. It became kind of a cognitive benefit for me. It, came, it became something that enabled me to incorporate that in real life situations, you know? Right. Give us an example. For an example is, therapists ask you very, very simple questions. You know what I'm saying? Starting with angry. It's like, okay, why were you angry? You know what I'm saying? What led to this anger? How did you feel when you they 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 go through this whole process to right. where you've ventured in every variation of the source of that anger. Right. Mm -hmm. To get to the root. Get to the root. Because if you only consider one part of it and don't address the rest, then you still got more fuel to act on the anger. Right. So it's like kind of like when you do like a diagnostic check or something. It's mm -hmm. like you go through this whole process of figuring out why am I mad in the first place. Right. And it made me think more like, yo, this is over some nonsense. I'm mad over nothing. Nothing. So Matter of fact, I'm mad about something prior to this that, situation. And, and you about to become the recipient of something that and don't that, even belong to you. Right. You know what I'm saying? So therapy gave me the ability to walk my issues down in real time, you know, in rapid succession, so I was able to start finding ways to avoid, you know, certain situations. So it was actually hard for me because I was working with students. They were students in City College. They were getting credits for these sessions. Mm. So the first guy, or the first lady was, um, her name was Elaine Gluckman, I'll never forget white lady and she just, I just never thought I would ever relate to her. I had all my walls up, all these barriers up and everything. And mm -hmm. then she penetrated and she was able to, 
you know, get me to open up, get me to unpack, stuff like that. Right. And then she left. Then I got this black dude, relatable. He was definitely, you know, very patient and stuff like that. So when the sessions was over, I started to utilize the same writing method. You know what I'm saying? Of explaining. To unpack. Yeah, right. Strictly for that. Wasn't thinking about no bars, none of that stuff. It was just, I'm in a mood. Let me just write it let down. it go. You know what I'm saying? Free write. That's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know? And then, basically, I started to add on to the process. Using it for the purpose of using it for the purpose of trying to deal with a matter in a way I would have wanted to do it. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Even though the issue, even though the issue passed, you mm. know what I'm saying? It's like, it's what I really would have, I, I wanted to do. I wanted to do this, I wanted to do that, I wanted to do that, I felt like, you know what I'm saying? And I think this is where a lot of rappers' imagination came from, but for me, it was therapeutic. I mm. never was to glorify myself or make myself Superman. I was always Clark Kent in this movie. Like every, I'm always, but, and I started these three steps. This is how I first started writing rhymes. I would write it first like I was writing it for a teacher. And I would write it like I was writing for somebody in jail. You know, you put all the slang in it. Yo, remember the kid D? Like, you know, you start making it a little bit more relatable to your peers. Right. And then I write it around. So by the time I did that three step, I created my own three step therapeutic process just to get past things. Never for the purpose of mm. trying to find a beat or nothing to attach to it. So why put it in a rhyme? Mm. Huh? Why why make it rhyme? Because that creative process burns some more fuel. It burns mm. some more. You mm. know what I mean? The easy mm. part to unpack is just, you know, this is for someone that can actually help me. I'm mm. talking to someone like a teacher, someone in a position of influence or authority. So right. when you state your claim to them, it has to be, you know, it has to be proper. Right, and, you know, exactly. You know so you would so you would take the what you would write for the teacher and what you would write for whoever in prison and you would put it together and make it run. Those first two steps. I was that that's what kept me within the confines of the issue. Okay. Because I'm addressing it in three different, you know, forms. Mm. You know. So I'm mm. not in Spain one minute, shooting somebody over here this minute, bungee over here, like you know how sometimes yeah. people just be all over people the place. People just be random. I and I feel like a, a lot of material that comes out nowadays is just random as Twitter. Yeah, I definitely don't know. Yeah, it's, it's scrolling. <laughs> it's like listening to somebody's verses like scrolling on social it media. Good, good, They're just good. going from topic to topic to topic to top jumble. Yeah. See, the only time I hear music when I'm in a place like this, mm -hmm. I haven't listened to music in 15 years. 15 years. 15 years. That's we, discipline. We definitely going to get to that. But yeah. before that, all right. Beverly Hills, you moved back out here. Moved back out. I crashed Beverly Hills. I crashed that joint, and, and, and <laughs> it was it was it was a travesty because oh no, all of the opportunities and things that I had. I'm literally classmates with Angelina Jolie. You know what I'm saying Angelina Jolie was Lee my ninth grade classmate. Class. Yeah, right. Monica Lewinsky was in the tenth grade. You know what I'm saying <laughs> Billy D. Williams' daughter, Michael Landry from Little House on the Prairie. His kids, like you know, what I'm saying I'm, I'm around. Was you and Angela cool? Like was you? Nah, she used to be with the Gothic crowd. So mm. she kind of used to dress like Wednesday Adams. <laughs> so right. Never really like, you know. But it was crazy because you learn in this different, you know, facets of, you know, peership. Like, you know, it's like New York is, you know, you can learn a lot. New York is like world traveling without going nowhere. Right. Mm. We got Little Italy, you got Chinatown, you know what I'm saying? You got, you know, Jamaicans, Charles, West Indians, Greece, right. Indians. Yeah, yeah, we got everything here. Right. So if you never left the country, you probably wouldn't have to. You know what I'm saying? If you visit these locations these where they're dominated by that ethnicity or that race, right? Because right? you're gonna you're gonna absorb some culture, you're gonna learn some things. You might even get a few words just so when you're passing through, you know how to say a right. few things and get going. Me ha ma. Shit like that. Shit <laughs> like that. You know what I'm saying? Right. So like being exposed to all of that, and then with George, like I said, George used to take fun out of movies. It was film school, you know what I'm saying? I would go to movies, and he would just dissect them. Like you see right there, this, that scene right there, I'm like, dang. 
<laughs> Must have been the story like, of the road. Just let them fly. Just let them fly. Yeah. You know what I mean? Right. You just had to clip his wings. You know what I'm saying? So it was like, it was a good study for me because that's what I was intrigued by. I mean, mm. one time I was playing ball. And he's like, yo, you know, Big Daddy Kane, I'm doing a concert. I'm like, nah, I'm cool. I wanted to play ball, you know? Mm. And it's like, I wasn't really interested. But like fast forward, I come back. Now I'm venturing in a space that's leading me to something that I never really had any aspirations. Well, for doing. What, what got you there? Was it? What got me there was I had bought a car that was tagged up. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Me and my man Dang. And my 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 my, my dude I was getting money with, he was a little older than me. He told me, like, don't get in that car, yo. Don't get in that car. But he don't know the conversation to have to do. It's tagged up. That joint is official. You know what I'm saying? Only thing missing is my license. But I can, you know, at least, you know, I ain't got to, you know, worry about no grand theft auto or nothing mm -hmm. like that. Yeah, you know what I'm yeah, saying? Yeah. I could deal with them taking me, you know, tow the joint, get somebody pick, you know. Yep, but right. that's how we was thinking. What? But he ain't do a good tag job. When I got pulled over, that joint was reported stolen. Mm. So, when he came to pick me up from the precinct, and we was riding back uptown, he was saying certain things like lines that sounded all too familiar. And that's when I remember. I left my book at the spot where we was getting money. I left my book, I had a composition book with all my stuff in it, and he was reciting some of the joints in there. Back to you. Yeah, and I'm like, you know, and I, you know, cause you know, it's private. Right, right. You no, know, this ain't stuff I share with you, with right. nobody. Right. Even though I may use one portion of it to include how I would communicate to somebody like you, but I would never do it. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because when we coming from, that's like a sign of weakness. That's a sign of you falling apart. Like you right. can't handle your hand. You know what I'm <laughs> right. saying? Exactly. You ain't supposed to be knowing that about right. me. But instead of him discouraging me, he encouraged me. Mm. He was mm. like, yo, you should. Keep doing this. Mm. And that and that lit the match. I'm still trying to figure out how you messed up, how you fumbled Cali, how you fumbled Beverly Hills to end up back in New York. Man, it's not, he's not going to tell us. You ever figured yeah. it out? Yeah. Yeah. Not, I mean, I am doing the documentary. He said it was, he said so it was, he said yeah. it was a travesty. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. that. I was waiting to hear how travesty we was going to Well, the hit. thing is, There was no rehabilitation in that whole process. <laughs> okay. George came to New York for six months to shoot New Jack City and left me in California by myself. So you you can figure the rest out. Mm. Mm. Say less. You know what I'm saying? When mm. I say like, Liddy. it was no way he was gonna be yeah. able to fulfill the commitment that he yeah, told my grandmother that he was gonna hold that. it down. I got it, but man, that was it. Right. That was it. I'm mm -hmm. in Beverly Hills. George had an M6 back then, 89, Corvette, Volkswagen, Cabriolet. I got access to all this stuff. I'm out here crashing his girlfriend's car. I mean, I, the list goes on. I did something. <laughs> every, every single day was something new. New. Mm. And I think that the people that was the recipients of it admired and respected George so much that they cleaned it up. Mm -hmm. So now I'm just getting off. Mm. I'm just getting you just going. No money. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yep. And to the last straw, I'm going to say that for something. You know, I'm going to say that for <laughs> the last the, straw, the, the, the defining moment that got me express mail back over here because I'm going to hold on to that. You know, <laughs> did you become affiliated out there? Yeah, I did. Actually, I did. You know, um, I got affiliated with a well known Crip gang. And the thing about it is crazy because this particular hood was more of a reflection of where I came from. Because you had like a, a real ethnic gang thing going on in some of these bigger neighborhoods, mm -hmm. you know, like South Central, Compton, Watts, whatever. These is rooted in this stuff. Right. But my hood, my clique, they was more West LA, Close to the Melrose, stones throw from sunset, but the same token, they were vicious. 
You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. But it was it reminded me of how we is. You know, New York, we know how to have fun. We know right. how to, you know, we know how to loosen up. Right. You know? And instead of wearing like lumberjack shirts and all that, like most of my homies was wearing like, you know, Michigan, because you know, we man's film used to have the Michigan joint with the big M, you know, you know, it was it, it was a little bit more trendy, they used to call it in LA. Like they were right. a little more trendy. Right. So you fit in. So I fit in. I found my crew. I yeah. found some people I could relate to. But the one thing about that whole experience and that union that I had with those guys all the way up to me leaving the music business, that was something else that got left behind. You know what I'm saying? All of it, all in one one kit caboodle was all done. But the one thing I pride myself on is I never felt compelled to bring that culture to New York. Mm. Even when you saw New York adapting that culture? No, when I seen New York adapting, I became appalled. You know what I'm saying? Because what it did, it birthed a lot of cats that wouldn't have never been recognized as certified New York dudes. Mm. You wouldn't have been a thorough New York dude. You wouldn't have been able to hit the island in 1990, 91, you know what I'm saying, and hold your own. Right. But now you with this bunch, you know what I'm saying? Right. You get to rock off somebody else on. Right. You get to throw yourself under somebody deodorant, and next thing you know, you, you know, you, 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 you lit. You got the rep that they got. Exactly. And you didn't earn it. Yeah. But with Cali, it was different because why I was so infectious is because you were being you were being reminded that if them dudes come through, they ain't gonna say, oh nah, that's Lil D. He's trying to play ball. Don't hit him. Hit them. That ain't how it works. Mm. You from that hood. Everybody goes. Everybody. Everybody. Goes. So now, with that fact being established, you might as well. It becomes right. one of them situations where you might mm -hmm. as well. This is where I'm from. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Mm. They ain't going to care. Because you're always it. going over such and such side of town to see your aunt. And you know that's 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 on site. And they know that you from over this way, or whatever the case may be. It's, it's just a matter of time you just never make it back. Right. Mm. You know, you mysteriously catch a flat. Can't fix it, you know what I mean? So that is why that mentality and that lifestyle was so infectious because it was by necessity. Our thing was hustle. That was our necessity, right? right? You don't, you're not able to do what you need to do. You gotta go to this, you know? Right. You don't go to no rag, not, not New York. No. Nah. You know what I'm saying? It made no sense. It didn't make no sense. Yeah. So when I seen that culture coming, I started seeing a lot of fraudulent dudes, dudes that definitely wasn't reputable, dudes start emerging. And it's like, like who? Right. The dude that used to have the salty tear streaks in his body, I mean, who? <laughs> OG triple what? Like, you know what I mean? Right. Like, these dudes start right. getting, no, that's, that's five star bloody, like, what? What? Five what? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you know what I'm saying? For, for me, earlier on, I, it was a lot of the soft niggas that was just but that's the thing. falling under the, under the umbrella. Protection. And I couldn't understand it. Like, I, I was going around the hood pulling people's mm -hmm. sleeves up. Like, they like yo, what we doing? What, what's going yeah. on? Protection, fear, yeah. acceptance. Why are we doing this? Yeah. We're not, this ain't us. Yeah. And that's what I'm saying, because it's like, I'm not a fan of criticizing nobody's choices. Right. I criticize the effect of your choices. Your choices is yours. Right. You got to live with that. But when your choices start to affect you know what I'm saying? Those in proximity, those who didn't sign up, you know what I mean? Now is a problem. Yeah, you know, and, now, and that's what yeah. was happening. And then the problem is it going unchecked. To be to be honest, one thing that I did notice was um there was also there was also something missing as far as community. Yeah. The community started like it used to be like uh, you know, your aunt would live on this floor, your your cousins or your your grandmoms was on this floor. Yeah. The families stayed together. That, as that community started to disparage, pe these kids were missing something to belong to. Acceptance. 
acceptance, acceptance. Yep. community, yep. really. Like, we all stick together type shit. That was missing. The and they found that. A, a lot of dudes found that in that. It, yeah, it did. And, that, and that's probably the only thing that justifies it yeah. for me. I don't know about anybody else, but I understand what it is. Like, we just started with talking about fathers, lack of, you know, father's presence. That's a void they got to get filled. Mm. That's a void that has to get filled. You know what I'm saying? And you took all of this into the music business. Yeah. Because your homeboy started rapping his, your own words back to you in the car. He literally took something that was a product of my vulnerability. You know what I'm saying? Which in our environment, that's what some dudes is waiting for. Yeah. That predatory instinct yeah. that we yeah. got, we waiting to see a crack in somebody's armor so we could just squeeze through it. Yeah. Right. But instead of him doing that, he just mended that joint real quick and was like, yo, this I didn't even tough. know you was doing that. I right. used to see you writing this, I didn't really know what you was doing. Mm. Like, mm. this joint is nice. Keep doing it. I'm like, all right, whatever, man, get my book. <laughs> yeah. All right, we're gonna take a five minute break. Cause I know we still haven't gotten to your music career at all. And well, listen, this is what I need y'all to do. Do y'all understand? I'm a, if you engage me, I'm a, I'm gonna talk. That's one thing about We've me. I'll, 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 I'll express myself. It's a good look. We love. You know, I don't have. Cause that's why I'm here. I came here. You know, mm -hmm. mm -hmm. y'all 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 platform is doing something beneficial for me because like maybe the whole 15 years i've been muslim and why i've been off the grid is because i've invested in that you know what i'm saying i've invested in every facet of what helped me get to a point in my life where i found the balance between who i was and who i am right because when i first became muslim i rejected it no, not even rejected it i was you know, it was like, Lightweight, I'm trying to heal. Like, doing I don't it. want to keep hearing about room. Like, I'm, I'm trying to heal. I'm trying to, like, get to it. You rejected who you were. Not so much. I ain't going to say rejected. It's just that I didn't want to entertain it no more. Mm. You know, cause what I was learning was contrary to who I was. So in order to get more immersed in what that means, I removed myself. I lived in Egypt. I moved to Egypt. I study, you know, I read, write, speak Arabic. I, I immerse myself and learn the religion. So then when I went to prison, and I remember the first, you know, I was playing ball. I went to ball for it. I was going to the basket. Dude was, you know, doing like a tango and cash at Rucker. Okay, you got your boy, boom, he's shaking. He's like, I just dropped the ball. I walked over to the table. Anything I quiet on y'all. I was like, listen, dog. I never introduced myself to you as well. My name is Amir. You want to say Air Moses, the bearded one. You can have fun with it. Yeah. We ain't going to do long. I went back to playing ball. So from that moment, everybody started to like, okay. Air Moses. He on his team. Yeah, it's cool. <laughs> like, yeah. That's to let you know I still have, you know, I'm not trying to be the party pooper. Right. But right. I just, you don't know. Right. Say Loon here, Loon ain't coming to prison. Amir is here. Right. Loon bill would have been different. You know what I'm saying? There's a lot of things could have transpired me being Loon in prison. Could have had a pregnant CEO. There was a whole lot of stuff that was on the table for Loon. Mm. The you discipline. Said, you said he, he, nah. Nah. You know, the discipline. He said he got on the money. We're recording. Oh, I thought he was waiting for him. He's going to come back. Right. Yeah. You know, the same, you know, the certain level of discipline. Right. I had to protect that, you know? And as time went by, I learned to accept it and appreciate it and understand that that's a door for someone to learn right. from me, you know? But at first, it was like, Shut it off. Yeah, I'm vulnerable right now. I'm still, you know, 
transition. I'm still trying to learn. I'm still trying to benefit. I'm trying to grow. Right. You know, and I can't allow you to stagnate me by trying to constantly. Cause I mean, everybody's like, yo, I do is walk up on me and present. Yo, it's New York Day. You coming to eat? Like, see, if you just say come to eat, how... I can't eat. Muslim, I don't celebrate no New York Day. Come on, I, I ain't that serious. I won't be there. You know, and it was just, it used to be like that. Cause people just want me to chime in. New York time, this, I'm not on none of that. Man. All right. Like a Muslim, yo, you know. But then I started to learn that, like, you know, they don't know, how, the, the cats don't know no better. They don't know no other way. That's a fact. You know what I'm saying? So I had to remove myself from just giving that harsh impression because I wasn't trying to be harsh. I was trying to protect myself. So, I was trying to right. protect my growth. But, and, but there's a part in transitioning where you kind of like ostracize people who are not of the same mindset. I remember um, when I started started studying the Torah, you know, everybody used to call me Jay Red. Mm-hmm. Once I changed my name, I was addressing everybody different, tell them don't don't call me. Same thing. Yeah. Same thing, because you kind of want to like push yourself away from what you considered as the wrong way of living. Yeah. And you don't want to be acknowledged as it. But at the same time, I left a lot of friends that was like, yo, he used to be my friend. Like, this used to be my man. Now he like, he pressing me over, calling him something. I called him for like 10 years. You know what I mean? Like, you know what I mean? So that shit is crazy. Yeah. But it, it's, I guess it's needed to like in, indulge in a, in a new, new side of you, but you kind of forget everybody I left is potentially me on the crossover. Yeah. You know what I mean? Or can potentially benefit from choices I made right and maybe want to invest in learning about what motivated those things right you know so that's really that's really the um the benefit for me is like because I mean I love my people you know mm-hmm. I love my people and I've endured the same struggle as any other black man in this country but there is a cure, you know, and it doesn't reside in nationalism. History will tell you that. No nationalist group was ever successful in mm-hmm. establishing unity. Because you can't do it if you're going to alienate everybody and just focus on your own right. ethnicity. All you're going to do is create the enemies. Of this is unity. Right. It's not real unity. Mm. You know? Because it's somebody who wants the same thing you want, but may not be from you. They don't get a seat at the table. I want peace. I want unity. I want these things. Because to be honest with you, if you look at any progress that ever took place in any civil rights movement or anything involving our people, had not it been white people getting involved, it wouldn't have pushed the needle. We just watched in our generation. We never lived to see the civil rights. We wasn't there. But right. we seen with the whole Black Lives Matter. matter. Yeah. Every time they put a camera, hoping they catch an abundance of black people, it was a bunch of white people. People, right in the front. <laughs> <laughs> right in the front. You know what I'm saying? Thanks. That's what really propelled our movement at that time. We ain't gotta tear it down. What transpired behind it, whatever the case may be. The reality of it is there was a vast majority of people who sincerely believed in that movement. Right. It doesn't mm-hmm. matter and they the have corruption. Or, it's always going to be that. Yeah. It's always going to be opportunists. It's always going to be people, you know what I'm saying, who are put in place you know, to try to benefit or gain from somebody else's hardship. Right. But ultimately, it opened <clears throat> A lot of people, eyes. like I said, you, you wasn't really going nowhere until it reached the hearts of other people. Mm. This was, because you can't say it matters just to us, right? It has to matter. If you say black lives matter, it has to just matter. Yeah, you can't to everyone. decide who it, who it matters to. to. Right. Sure. You know what I'm saying? Cause you remember that scene in Malcolm X when the white lady came out the mouth and was like, well, well, how can I help? He's like, you can't. 
Yeah. <laughs> painful. <laughs> painful. Crush the whole dream. Crush the down. whole Yo, dream. Everything. Like, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. But look what it took for him later. To figure that to out. To figure that out. Mm-hmm. You know? Mm. So, you know, if this was 15 years ago, I would be interested to hear the song that would come from these ideals. Mm. It would be very interesting to see you put this on wax and take your fan base from I need a girl to <clears throat> here's real unity. I don't know if people would accept it. It's not it's not the point. I when, wouldn't I wouldn't want you to think you, about when it. When you say you don't know. Yeah. I That's mean, just my opinion. I'm just saying because the way I see the game, you know, your impression or the impression that you made yeah. See if LL could do it. You saw Kanye do it. I see J. Cole doing it. <laughs> but Kendrick I don't know. I, I, I right. never really witnessed none of that. Trust me. Tr- that's, why I, that's why I said, I trust me. On it. I would be interested to see what. But you stepped away from yeah, music yeah, completely. 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 Yeah, completely. Yeah, completely. Which is insane when you consider the heights that you were at and who you were doing it but with. But not, not only that, we've had conversations. We had conversations about rhyme patterns yeah. and just breaking down the structure of it. And after those conversations, I thought to myself, I was like, damn. But he, he really can't indulge anymore. But you have a vast knowledge. Like, I couldn't have that conversation with most rappers. Yeah. You know, they just, well, he rapped like this and he rapped like that. But to be able to break down the structure and why and how this would go this way and this would go this way with this person, and they... It's just different. I think the thing I appreciate the most now is that I actually have a voice. You don't have no memorable interviews alone during my career. Puff did right. all the talk. Right. <laughs> just be honest. You know what I'm saying? I remember right. one time they wouldn't even let me present an award. You know what I'm saying? Like he was running late. And I'm like, yo, I'm here. He was like, yeah. how far is Puff here? Like, you know, it was just like, they was content wow. with he had to come. And be the and be the presenter, the voice. Like I didn't have the vocabulary or the ability to articulate whatever was necessary for a simple, you know, what I'm saying segment of and next, you know, what I'm saying whatever, right? You know, and that was something that was that was something that was understood in the business at the time. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? So the fact that I don't do music no more. But I found another way to express, you know, certain passions that I have for bringing about rectification, you know what I'm saying, with the youth, you know, aid and assisting those who can't do for themselves, prison reform, all these things that actually matter. Mm-hmm. And to be honest <clears throat> with you, and I don't want anybody to take this the wrong way. It's like when you bring one talent to the table, people expect you to utilize that for everything else. You right. understand what I'm saying? Right. It's like uh Did I even go through that with some, you know, you know, people within the Muslim community. Mm-hmm. Like, why don't you just do like Islamic songs? It's like, damn, that's all I'm good for? No, but it, No, no, no. Give it's, me that's it's not I to say I know that. A, I know that, right. but I just gotta understand that sometimes it could be easily perceived that that's the only benefit you see a person capable of bringing. Mm-hmm. I, I'm that's, not gonna. Yeah. I, I can't agree. I'm with not that. saying that's your opinion. I'm just right. saying for me personally, because right. it's like I, I, not, I, I have other other things. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, but right. You got, but you still have this one too. Yeah, like yeah. this one didn't vanish because you picked up something else. And and this one well for me it hit, yeah. but no it didn't vanish. This you just got rid. You just hit. you locked it away. It then you look, have a look. conversation with 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 uh. This some MC on the I have an artist named named Brooklyn Hands. I've watched a room full of battle rappers who are like the most egotistical people, mm-hmm. artists on the planet. Shut up and ask him to spit another verse. And at one point. He wanted to change his life when OT got different. And I, I would tell him, I'm like, yo, you out there trying to be Douglas. 
Bro, <laughs> bro, the world, the world, the world know you as hands. Yeah, like you could still be that, but be hands. They know you as hands. Just show them who hands is. Show them all the facets of hands. But don't just say I can't be hands no more. I want to be Douglas. Nobody know Douglas. You dig what I'm saying? You dig what I'm saying? You gotta think about look. He said, I don't even know what that means. <laughs> Sometimes you gotta look at like when a person acquires peace. I get it. You know what I'm saying? I get it. And that's what this is? Absolutely. I, I get it. Absolutely. But but here's the thing. If you want to influence people, I could put a mirror on this interview if you want. Mm -hmm. But when I put Loom, and people go, oh, oh I remember Loom. And they click, they see what you're doing now. It shows them, oh, you could go from this to this. That's the point, though. That's what, you know that, what I'm I saying? mean. That's what we discussed previously. It's like, I've learned to embrace that. Right. Hmm. So you put a loon on the interview, it's not a, it's not a fraction of anything. It's like, yo, that, that's, that's what's up. Right. You know what I mean? Because that's who you know from based on your audience. Right. You know what I'm saying? Your followers. That's who they know sitting in this chair. You know, mm -hmm. I'm not opposed to that. All right, so let's you know talk. I mean? Let's let's talk about what Loon did. Let's talk about what Loon did. Okay. Um, getting your record deal. You went wait, from so, um. Wait, so he, he came back to New York. To no, no, we his we, rhyme, so. Right, but you were part of um, a rap group called Crime Family. Mm. Yeah, that was I, me and my man Nitty. Right. Yeah, me and my man Nitty. And um we was we was we was making moves underground. You know what I'm saying? We used to do, you know, Maria Davis joint. Yeah. Yeah, so Shout out Maria yeah, Davis. Yeah, Maria you know, Davis. Definitely <laughs> Maria's, you know, it's sad that people don't really give her her flowers, you know, because mm. she definitely created a platform for a lot of people. We definitely need to make you that know, happen. Definitely. Definitely need you know to what make that happen. I'm talking about you wouldn't even really caught the full effect of J twenty two tools if it wasn't, if it for, wasn't yeah, for right. Maria Davis. I was dead when he did that. I don't mm. know if they you was there. Yeah, they recreated it probably for the album, but the actual night he did that, standing there with a bottle of Chris in his hand, leather trench coat. It was like smoother hustle, trigger the game. Like it, it was like. This was that circuit. These were the the, the, the frequent flyers. You know yeah. what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. They came through this circuit. Right. You know? And to be there, you know, at that time, you know, that was that was a success. Wow. If you never got signed, mm -hmm. you never did anything. Yeah. If you was the You remember yeah, that night. Yeah, you know what I'm saying? So yeah. that's why I said like my story is about evolution. It's about growing. You know what I'm saying? So from that. We got signed to Tommy Boy. Right. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. Fat Man Scoop signed us. He was an A and R there. Chop After he signed us, he left. So now the only person that understands what we're trying to do Dude. just left. left. They had some dude named Ian Steeman from the UK. Ian Steeman. He was, that's a real name. That's a real name. He mm -hmm. was the A and R on Steeman. our project. <laughs> mm. Fresh out of UK. Probably graduated from Oxford. Who knows? But he was in no way, shape, or form prepared to do prepared to deal with a group named Crime Family that had an album called Harlem World. This is in '96. '96. Mace came out '97. You know what I'm saying? And I remember doing a Maria Davis those circus. Bethel used to be in the audience. You know, he was studying yeah. like anybody at that time. Cause yeah, I remember like. Blink was in BBO. We had a lot of little, you know, groups coming out of Harlem. Yeah, BBO, it was Blink, Beef, White Bread. They Maces in BBO. You know, said periodically before they went their Children of Corn. Corn. You had a uh, uh, Major League, my man Fute, and uh, 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 um, Norm. You had yeah, we had our little. We, you know, this was the first time because you gotta remember if you look at historically mm. Harlem. We were the backdrop to hip hop. We wasn't Curtis Blow was us. That was that was it. Right. 
Like, right. Curtis Blow, Cool Mo D. You know right. what I'm saying? And Queens and Brooklyn. Y'all was the ones that had an abundance of rappers. Yeah. We was the ones that came wearing the big coats and like we, you know, we was the promotional vehicle. Right. For hip hop. Mm. Right. Harlem. Dougie you know Fresh. Yeah. yeah. Dougie Fresh. Yeah, Ted, you know what I'm saying? Like, you know, we was, you know, that that's that's the role we played. So when this little surgeons uh Harlem rap group started coming about, it was just like, it was big for all of us because we all knew each other. We all knew of each other, knew each other. It was just like, it, was, it wasn't even as competitive as it probably was in Brooklyn or Queens or whatever the case may be. Right. We were just happy to be doing something. Like, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> but then when it got real, it got real really when Herb McGruff got signed. Mm. When McGruff got signed to Uptown, it was real now. It's like, this ain't, they, we ain't playing no more. more. Yeah. You know, you're getting checks for this stuff. Like, some, you know, there's it, deals involved. Mm. Right. He did the single with Monif. It was like we looking at Gruff one in the video, like, oh man, this is. How, how did you feel about that? I was happy. I was happy. So some some people felt like Gruff wasn't being Gruff. Well, Gruff was doing being what was allowed at the time. You know, mm. you had to have radio records. You wow. had to. That was a contingency. <clears throat> You know what I mean? You had to have it. Well, a label not going to even sign you unless you got at least one, two singles in a pipe. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. that, was, that was a contingency just to get signed. You know? The one hmm. you care about, want to know about your whereabouts. <laughs> then I dissed you. So now I miss <laughs> you. Yeah, yeah. 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 Shout out to McGruff. Yeah. 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 Oh, bruh. It's all the happy, kids. Man. Yo, my bruh. man furs on me back. Shout yeah. out to Gruff. Yeah. Yeah. It was, yeah, it was, a was outside. Yeah, Ruff was outside. Yeah. Yeah. Was outside. So like to see that, that was, was big like, for us. Right. You know what I'm saying? Coley by far was the nicest dude in Harlem. I don't care what nobody say. Who? Big L. Big L. Big L. Coley. Coley was the best. Coley on. No, I get it. He was the best mm -hmm. rapper that ever come out of Harlem in our generation. I don't think nobody from Harlem would disagree with that. Mm. If they do, if they shit. do, they being unjust. Mm. You know mm. what I'm saying? Telling more about them than they are about the scene. Man. Telling on themselves. Yeah. That so, was vicious, man. There was a time when them, I remember in that er era, uh, getting a guy from Harlem became the thing for like every label. It's like everybody wanted to get at least one Harlem dude. Every crew had to have a dude from Harlem. Started with Heavy D getting McGruff. And next thing you know, Diddy gets Mace. And no, L was digging in the crates. No, L, mm -hmm. no, L, no yeah, but L was. No, that's digging in the crates. Yeah, but I, I don't, I don't, I don't. I mean, he was the first. Yeah, because right. that's that's why I don't count it. Because when he did it, it wasn't about getting a Harlem dude. Lord Finesse just got somebody who was nice. Yeah. It wasn't, he didn't get him because he was from Harlem. He got him because he, he was, was nice. He was a beast. Right. But then a Harlem MC became the thing to go get for every label and every crew. They seemed to, it, it, that picked oh, yeah, up oh, with McGruff. Oh, no, yeah. Nobody's disputing that. Yeah. Yeah. Him putting Harlem on the map in that way. Nobody's disputing that at all. But he didn't make, it wasn't the du jour when L got signed. It was because he was the, <laughs> out of everybody rapping, and as much of a beast as, as Lord Finesse was himself, for him to get another guy and be like, okay, this dude. Yeah, that was big. Yeah, pass, right. passing that the torch big. to L was yo, crazy. Yo, monk stories. <coughs> like you said, <laughs> Bethel was there. He was studying. Yeah, he was there. Now, people, what do you say to people who, who thought that you were his replacement? I think that, and I mentioned this somewhere before, how... People just try to find a way to identify with something right. from something else. You know what I'm saying? Like you said, Harlem, we had our own kind of swag. Mace eventually became the first to do it mainstream. Had it been me, the probably the story would have been the other way around. Right. Mace is, you know, following a loon or vice versa. Because even like when Fab did it, I never thought Fab sounded like Mace. You know what I'm saying? I, I thought did. Fat, you did? Yeah, I mm -hmm. did. I mean, I thought, I thought he had his own, I think he had, I, I always believed, and still to this day, I always thought Fab had his own style. You know what I'm saying? Look, I, got, I got mad love for Fab, but when I heard Nori, that Nori freestyle on Clue, uh, 
I was like, yo, Mace's body in this shit right there. <laughs> and oh, it was yeah? fab. And wow. it was fab. It's the monotone. Yeah, it was, it was just that tone. Yeah, it was that it. tone. Yeah. Like, you know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It's the monotone. Yeah. But. Because I never discredit Mace. Like, Mace is nice. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Mace was nice back then. I don't know too much about what he's doing now because I really don't listen. Like I said, I don't listen to music, but I would never discredit what he was able to come out and accomplish. I think the discrepancy was stemmed from Harlem World. Did did y'all have a a, a relationship? Because you had the Harlem World with crime family, right? No, we really. I mean, I I didn't I didn't grow up with Mace. I didn't really know Mace like that. Right. Enough. I'm saying. So having a Harlem I knew I knew Blink longer than I knew Mace or anybody. Like, you know what I'm saying? I knew Cam before I knew Mace. Was Blink the bridge between y'all? Was it? I'm the bridge between everybody. Right. So so when Mace came out with the Harlem World title, did you feel a way about it? Absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, You talking about no gun, no kung fu, no nothing. You stuck me up. Like basically, like you know, I've I felt like, damn, like it was already known. Y'all was pushing one way. Me and Nitty was pushing one way. Everybody had, you know, some uniqueness that was going to eventually establish Harlem. Whoever get there first, it didn't matter. But we all were pushing a certain They're direction. Your own you thing. know what I'm saying? Right. Harlem world to us at the time, as far as crime family was the foundation of what we represented. You know what I'm saying? Mm. We, were, we were coming from a place of, there is no other reason why we're doing this. You know what mm. I'm saying? There's no other reason why we're doing this. We're doing this to establish mm. all of No different than BBO, no different than Children of Corn, but we actually, you know, we created a vehicle for it. You know, and when Mace, you know, took the Harlem world. You didn't feel like it was coincidence by no ways. No. I knew it wasn't no coincidence. Did you address him? Huh? Did you address him about it? You you knew it because Blink told you? No. (laughs) (laughs) Nah, nah. nah. (laughs) Nah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> now nah, definitely like it wasn't because of blink. Right. Like I knew, I knew that it wasn't no coincidence. And I did a couple Ron G joints addressing it. That's how I addressed it because I couldn't get in the same space as Mace at that time. Right. You know. So I took, you know. Ron G. I, I used I did a couple joints of Ron G going in. I was at the end of the song talking crazy before anybody ever heard pop, like spending another extra five minutes to want to run down. Like, yeah, 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 I was doing all that on Ron G. You know, and when we did finally get the shared space, it was mediated by my man Trail. Trail died. Mm-hmm. But Trail was from 40th Street. Trail knew me. You know what I'm saying? For being outside, but mm-hmm. Mace had bought him, you know, in proximity of his like situation. Mm-hmm. And when he came up with the Harlem World idea, he used that bridge at the time was Trail. You know what I'm saying? Trail came and seen me, like, yo, son, trying to put together this Harlem World joint. He wanted to be you, Big L, Cam, Gruff. Hmm. So in my mind, I'm like, Hold on, hold on, yeah. hold on, hold on, hold on. Hold that was on, the original. On. The original Harlem world was supposed to be. This is how it was originally presented you, to me. Big L, Gruff. Cameron, and Herb McGruff. Herb McGruff. That's how it was originally presented to me. Bruh. But at the time, I don't think he was going to ever be able to get or establish an allegiance with none of those people I named because whatever relationship he may have soured or tarnished or blemished whatever it wasn't gonna happen Mm. but i was intrigued because that was the way it was presented to me right 
But then when he got the situation with Jermaine Dupree and you know, all that, you know, I had a situation on the table where Arista Clive had, you know, offered me a solo deal. Hmm. And I literally asked Clive, you know, I want to do this Harlem World Project. Because I think it'd be a great vehicle for me to double back and do my solo joint. So when Mace got the deal with Jermaine Dupree, and basically, you know, revamped the whole group. It was like, it's going to be me, Blink, HUD, Mino, caught in. So when you look at that lineup, it's like, okay, cool. It's some balance in that. Mino hard. You know what I'm saying? Like, the, the I mean Burns that I know, Mino, Mino yeah. was hard. You know right. what I'm saying? Caught in was dead nasty. Like. Right. Like, Cardan was always nice, you know? Blink, like I said, came out of BBO. So he had something to offer. Hud was probably the only one that didn't really rap. You know what I'm saying? But Hud was oh, the, piece yeah, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. yeah. But Hud was the personality that you just could not right. deny. Nah, right. You know what I'm saying? And then Stace, Nate's sister. I honestly looked at that always as that's just a playoff mace. Right. You know what I'm saying? Even though Stacey, she tried, you know, she put in the work. She tried to, you know, she tried to put her best effort forward. But unfortunately, you know, when that project took off and we were definitely putting in the work, Mace just abruptly quit. Mm. Out of nowhere. I remember we was in like Alabama on the radio. We we selling Harlem World like, yo, it's going down next to you. No. They're like, so how y'all feel about Mace quit? We all looking at each other like, what? And everybody really looked straight at Stace. We all just turned around and looked at Stace. Cause that's your twin brother, not just your brother. Yeah. That's your twin, twin brother. Yeah. And we out here in the middle of Alabama somewhere. <laughs> you know what I mean? <laughs> we didn't see that coming. We right. just like, you know, yeah, Harlem World, you know, we, we, you know, we trying to sell. Right. And like, yo, why y'all feel about Mace quitting the music business? Everybody looked at Stace. Mm. And she had a look on her face like she didn't even know. Mm. Wow. So at that point, it was like, yo, it's over. It was it's done. Over. This situation only makes sense because of him. Mm. Right. You know what I'm saying? If he going, we going. You know? Mm. And I was fortunate enough. Clive Davis still gave me my solo opportunity and I signed to Arista. You know what I'm saying? From Arista. From Arista, working at Arista. We had a great album. You know what I'm saying? I was putting together. Yeah, keep going. Yeah, hang on. Yeah, keep going, keep going. Keep going, keep going, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? From Arista, mm -hmm. I was working on a great album. And then Clive came, made an announcement. That he was leaving Arista forming J Records. <laughs> Records, right. And I'm like, I can't win. I can't People win. just leave. Yeah, <laughs> I'm, I'm, yeah, I'm just a victim of abandonment. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> <laughs> like, you know, and it's funny now, but when you think about, about it, going back to what we started, the yeah. fathers, everything, all like, all it was just always right. some form Theme, of abandonment. Yeah, right. You know what I'm saying? And at that point, the only ray of light that came through is that, you know, Mark Pitts was my manager. Right. Shout out to Mark Pitts, you know. Storm. Yep. I was Biggie manager. Right. And Mark was managing me and he ended up getting the A and R position at Arista under LA Reed. So now we have somewhat of a conflict of interest because like, you can't manage an mm. artist and, and be an A and R at the same time. Yeah. But Mark made it happen for me. With respect to his growth in the business at the same time, he leave Loon hanging. He said, yo, I heard Puff down in Miami, you know, working on the album. You wrote for him before on the Forever album. So, you know, I told him, you know, boom, boom, boom. He wants you to come down there for four days and write two songs. I ended up going down there for four weeks and I wrote 11 songs, you know, and the rest was history. Within those 11 songs, mm -hmm. was I Need a Girl in there? The original I Need a Girl. Because really, people don't understand this. Yeah. No, 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 no. That's part two, really. Mm. And Mario Wines and Jenny Wines is actually part three. Three. The wow. first three. one is in the P. Diddy and the Bad Boy family. Yeah. I'm going to leave y'all to do y'all homework. 
Not the saga continues. The saga continues. Oh, the saga yeah. continues in 02. Oh, that girl on that joint. Wow. The original I Need a Girl with mm. Jack Knight singing on the um, chorus. It was yeah. a whole different type yeah. of hook and everything? It was a... Listen. It was different. It di- yeah. It was I Need a Girl, the original I Need a Girl. You want to know what's so funny right. about it? I didn't, that didn't land until he said it. Yeah. I would I would have went my whole the life. Original I need a girl. It's like it's like Shook Ones being Shook Ones Part Two. Two, yeah. Mm-hmm. Or, or Mob Deep actually having an album before the Infamous. People don't realize that they were yeah, the whole. People know it's like, shit, it's, what's yeah. the Shook Ones Part One. But if yeah. you say it, if you say you know Juvenile Hell, people, it's just like when he said it, it was like, yeah, bang, wow. yeah. Because the thing was, you know, he was going through the whole situation <laughs> with Club New Yorker thing, right, and. When I got down there, I remember clear as day. I think they had went out to like club space or something, and I was like, I ain't, I ain't here for that. You know what I'm saying? Because I had something very serious going on in my personal life, and it's like I needed to make this work and get back to that. You know what I'm saying? But as I was sitting, they had a blackboard up with all the stuff that needed to be done. So it'd be like a song that had no hook, need two verses, need three verses, and a bridge. This like it was already laid out and all of these lackadaisical efforts that was taking place was like, you know, like maybe people were putting in the work and probably like, I only like that verse, I only like that, I only mm-hmm. like that. So I'm looking mm-hmm. at like a skeleton of what could potentially Everything be an album. Everything needed to be done, right. You know, and I remember when they went out to go party or something that night and I was working three rooms at the same time. I went in and did one joint with Faith on it, went over here, did this. So when they came back, it's like, this kid is a wolf. Like, I'm, I'm you know. Yeah, you was on. I'm hungry. You was on. I'm you don't even remember me being in the studio with you. Yeah. We talked wow, about it. Yeah, we talked yeah, about I remember, it. Yeah. I remember. I mean, at the time, you know, we didn't really get the bill bill. Right, right. Because, you know, it was a lot I looked at on. everybody that was passing through there, like, to be honest with you, I wouldn't even say competition, but someone that was in, that had the potential right. to make sense of this mess. That I was trying to make sense of, you know, mm-hmm. you know. Oh, was... so, I want to know how you went through all that street street shit that you went through in your life, mm-hmm. and you happen to do records for females. I'm sorry. You happen to start doing records for females. Well, the thing is, when I first got the bad boy, I was trying to give him a loan out. Like I had a lot of joints that just didn't make it out. Puff was like, "Yo, you gonna end up on tour with Marv D." <laughs> he used to say that to me. And I, yeah, you know, at first, you know, because you were doing street yeah. shit. Nah, listen, yeah. it's, not a, it's not a bad first, thing, but I yeah, get it. Yeah, because at first, when you hear that, it kind of hit different. It's like part of your mind, like, what's wrong with that? Right. You know what I'm saying? Like, what's wrong with Mob Deep? Right. You're right. on tour Mob Deep. Right. But then you think about it, because I've been to some joints with Mob Deep Rock. Mm-hmm. And it's just a room full of hoodies. They're not doing 80,000. Yeah, yeah. Right. They're not doing arenas. Right. You know what I'm saying? There's no pyro on stage. Right. You ain't flying from the bottom. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> like, you, you ain't, you know. None of that's going on. <laughs> it's not the greatest show on earth. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right, right. You and that joint is, is you know, wall to wall. Hoodies. hoodies. Nobody dancing. Everybody yeah. got their hands in their, their pockets. pockets. Right. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. First dude loosen up his food. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, the first dude that loosen up. You know what I'm saying? He's like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. Like, you know what I'm saying? Right. And he summed that up in just one statement. Like, yo, yeah. you gonna end up on tour with Mom D. Yeah, that's like, real man. ice in that chain right there? You know what I'm saying? I yeah. go right with my pinky. No right question. Right you know what I'm saying? So it's like, like I said, I was conflicted. Like, first, like, what's wrong with that? Right. You know what I mean? But then it's like, I get it. You have a blueprint that works regardless how any artist you ever had felt about it. It worked. It worked for the locks. Right. You know what I'm saying? Definitely worked for Mace, it worked for Big, worked for Craig Mack, worked for everything that is bad boy. You know what I mean? And I'm coming to be a part of something, right? So at that point, 
I understood the assignment. Right. Mm. It's like, we got to, you know, it ain't broke. It ain't broke. Don't I'm going to get so. my opportunity to do life after death. Yeah. I just got to. Do this you know, I see I make it through customs. That's all. Right, that's if I get it. through customs, I'm straight. You <laughs> right, know what I'm saying? Right. And, and, and at least that's what I thought. You know what I mean? Because now, from that compilation we do, we invented the remix. Mm. That's when the first I Need a Girl came out. Second one, he wanted to make a remix. I'm like, nah, they got to be part two. Was y'all all in the studio together for that? What? The remix. Um, the one with Usher? Part yeah, two. Usher. Nah. 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 Because when I got the beat, it was a skeleton. It just shout, shout out to my man Coptic. He produced that. Yeah. 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 Coptic yeah. definitely produced shout that. Shout out to joint. Coptic. And Coptic kind of made my life miserable for like, I, I don't know, maybe a couple of days. I struggled with the beat because the way it came, it was just a skeleton. It mm. went then, 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 then. What the fuck to do with this? You yeah, know right. what I'm saying? Because yeah. it, it didn't have all the, the added whistles. Right. It was just the, you know, I'm like, this, 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 I don't know. And with days went by, a couple days went by, I sat in the studio for 15 hours just taking all the abuse of this, this, this beat that was just like, it's a, melody. It's a fucking melody. And Puff used to come in that joint lit, like, yo, like, like he would come in like, yo, what we got? Yeah. Like, like he knew right. this was it. Yeah, I'm just yeah. like, I don't know. I'm not there with you yet. I yeah. was not there, yeah. you know? I just wasn't there. So he said, all right, this is his way of making it easy. Then he had Justin Timberlake take a crack at it. He had Justin Timberlake, Genuine, and Usher. Usher murdered that joint. So now the next time I got the beat back, it had the, the chorus on the act. Uh, okay. Yeah, I got it now. You know what I'm saying? So right. now I got a post. Like, you know, it ain't take me nothing but like maybe 15 minutes after that to wow. knock that joint out. Because now I had the vision, I had everything. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, he kind of spoke those words into existence. You know, we had a conversation. He was telling me about certain things that was taking place in his life. And it's like, he didn't know he was writing the joint. I'm in so, my mind, like, okay, yeah. you know, yeah. 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 That three-step process. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. That three-step yeah. process. One Whoa. for the teacher, one for the hood. Make it rap. That's bang, right. bang. That's right. So he's doing the version of the second form. Mm -hmm. Listening to it, I'm like, man, how can I translate this to somebody who, you know, got a diploma, like doctor or something. Right. But he's telling it like the jail. He's like, yo, son, for real, I got all this money. He named him Earl and this. I'm like, man, that's everybody's story. Oh, yeah. Like he became normal to me. Like it wasn't the puff daddy that everybody looked at. It's like he got the same problem as dude on the block. Right. Right. You know what I'm saying? He just had a loss. They just ran, kicked this joint in, and now he got to go back to like, you know what I'm saying? Right. He got to start all over. And I was like, this is it. You know? And I wrote that joint. That joint hit. Second joint came. I mean, listen, that joint was like a 12,000 spins a week. Like that joint. Like, yeah. Couldn't get away my from first, fire. My first performance was in Radio City. Damn. Like literally, it wasn't like no club dates. I'm in Radio City. I never forget butterflies. Like I'm shook. Cause I mean, because it's Radio City. It ain't really like, you know what I'm saying? It ain't no real aviance to it that'll make you fearful. It's like this is Radio, Radio City. City. Mm -hmm. You know? And I remember like pacing, cause like he doing certain medleys. Cause you know, Puff got so many songs he's featured on. He could do an hour of just medleys. So I'm backstage pacing, my nerves is shot. I'm like, Man, this is Radio City. You know what I mean? <laughs> mm -hmm. And I remember asking, man, what's her name? I asked her, like, yo, it was the lady outside front selling roses. Could you just give me, like, one long stem rose and take the thorns off? I slid up on the light, and, man, look, I'm going to come out from this side of the stage. I need to dim all the lights. I'm trying to create my moment. moment. This is right. my moment. You know what I'm saying? Puff don't even know I'm scheming like this. I'm just saying, <laughs> like, he on there lit. Right. You know, lights got him looking like the only person in the room. I'm like, I'm learning in real time, right on the spot. Like, okay, I'm gonna come out this way. I need you to have a light fine. He's like, oh, I can do that for you, room. Perfect. 
She came with the rose. You know what I'm saying? I came out, pandemonium. And I remember like extending the rose out and like these girls, lilies, full blown MMA match for this one rose. <laughs> <laughs> the girl that got it, I'm looking at the, the, the ones on the side, they looking at her like they just going. <laughs> <laughs> knock, my yo, they about to knock all the French out of my mouth. Wow. <laughs> I might have panned and panned back. The girl was gone. <laughs> Somebody else was holding the rope. I said, yo. <laughs> from that moment, I swear by Allah, from that, no, that moment right there, I said, this is powerful. <laughs> <laughs> he was right. I don't want to be on Terramar D. <laughs> Definitely don't want to be the hoodies went out the window Man, after that. Yo, I didn't even want to hear a beat that would what? lead me on to it. <laughs> or even remotely close to Mark D. One long stem rose and a little tweak of the light. Some good music. Some yo. good music. You know what I'm saying? Crazy. Yeah. And I remember when part two came out, he wanted to make it the remix. I'm like, nah, because in my mind, I'm like, I own my publisher. Yeah, a remix because yeah. they would have put it under the same. The remix is just to extend the life of a song. Right, that joint is a beast. We're not doing a remix. We'll do part two. There it is. You know what I mean? Yeah. I was happy that he bought he, into it because in my mind I was thinking solo because it really initially it was kind of presented as it was Mario Wine's record first, but the bridge that he did was like the only thing I think Puff liked. Then it's like it came to me. It's like, mm -hmm. okay, it's gonna be a single. So I'm thinking in my mind, I'm gonna call it Pretty Woman. I'm gonna do the whole Richard Gere, Julia Roberts look. Black. My mind is gone. This is what I'm thinking. I'm thinking out of the stratosphere. I'm like, I'm thinking enormous. Right. I think when I did the first verse on that joint, son just put that whole idea to sleep. Like, and I knew it. I, I just felt the vibe. I might go to do his verse too. I, he ain't gonna let me live. <laughs> you know what I mean? Right. Yeah, because like, you know, I was in, I'll never forget, I was in a bungalow. We was in Circle House Studios in Miami and, when my, and when Mario was in there trying to like add more to it. And I was just like, put a joint down. It was worry. like, let son hear that, seen his face. It was like, okay, let me just go ahead, get his joint. See, now right. a moment like that, that's what I got to witness. Because I remember you playing a verse to a remix of an R&B record mm -hmm. in the studio. I'm sitting in the back. I think Mouse was there. Because mm -hmm. Fox was in the other room. Mm -hmm. He was just sitting in your session talking shit. And he walked in, he's like, you want me to hit a record? Played it. And I was like, dude, you getting off on this. All right, cool. He turned it off. He was like, word. Now write, now write your verse. Yeah. <laughs> he walked yeah. out. And I was like, oh, <laughs> shit. This how I go down in here? That's crazy. But see, that's the thing. And when you told me at the first time, I was like, oh, I ain't never known him to be like, but then I thought about it, like, it became a known thing that, you know what I'm saying? Like I said, when you have somebody that's your CEO, but he's also an artist, right. you know what I'm saying? You got to get past the fact that not involving him is mm -hmm. not involving millions and millions of people who know him. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's an ego thing. You know what I'm saying? That right. I had to remove and understand that, you know. But just like any artist, at some point, it's like, I got to get off this train. Right. Like, for real, we can't. Yeah. This can't always be that. Be that. You know what I'm saying? And it can't always be like, okay, the momentum is there. And it's like, now we're going back to giving you three verses of your own for you to, like, you know, propel your career. Right. You know, and then the whole making of the band thing came in. It was like, my joint got pushed back to drop the band out. And I was like, so now, and this is why most people ask me, like, why I left. It wasn't so much about nothing to do with Puff. Puff ain't persuade me to be Muslim. I don't think he persuade, you know, Mace to be Christian, Sean to be Jewish. Right. It's just that when you understand that this is a business, you know, and business it's not going according to, you know, the work you put in. It's like, okay, listen, it was a time when you was at a rough patch. Me being the kind of dude I am, loyalty. I'm going to help you get right because that's what I learned in the street. If I help my man get money, I'm going to get money. 
You know what I'm saying? I think everybody, a lot of street dudes that came in the music business don't understand the dudes that you're dealing with ain't from the street. So you can't come with the mentality expecting them to reciprocate something that you understand in the street. Right. They don't understand that. Right. You know? So that was my mentality. All right, cool. If I get this right, double back, get me right, everybody right. We're good. And we good. But when I started seeing, like, hold up. Slipping a lot of Mickeys in there, dog. Like, let me um, let, let, let me breathe. Like, let, let, come on, man. Like, I got, I just got my first set of wings. Like, let me fly. Like, it was, I started feeling like I was being impeded from growing. Like that mm-hmm. time, your time was never gonna come. Well, the time was then. Right. Time came. You no, know, but you know what yeah, I mean. Yeah, the time came. The time was then. The right. time was at that moment. The push, the support, and everything that was needed to solidify that time for me wasn't there. Mm. So at that point, I felt it was the best thing for me was, you know. Do you think at that point he was jaded? A little? I wouldn't say jaded. I just think, like I said, you know, it's just that. Or apprehensive. I believe that I was definitely in a very unique situation. Cause like I said, you're dealing with another artist. But if you look at the music business, right? L.A. Reid, he had a lot of face. L.A. Reid ain't never tried to get on nobody records. All his artists thrived. Whatever he needed to support their careers and help them go, they grow. Right. Suge Knight ain't never tried to get on nobody's song and like that, you know what I'm saying? Certain you know, success that comes from having CEOs that don't have the ambition of artists, you know what I'm mm-hmm. saying? That don't want to be all in the videos. Yeah, but mm-hmm. the reality of it is, you know, it was working for him. Yeah. It ain't like this was somebody- It was, it was a winning formula. Yeah, that was trying to force, you know, right. a, 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 a non-talented situation and, and put it, you know, before Not. true mm-hmm. talent is like- This work from the rip. The guy's talented, mm-hmm. you know what I'm saying? And if you think about the work that he did um, prior, having his own label and how he was kind of pushed out of that situation. This was like preemptive to for that never to ever happen again. Mm. That could be. That could yeah. definitely be his, you know, psychosis. You know, that could be his mindset. But for me being in my twenties at that time, I'm not thinking mm. like that. I'm right. just thinking like, yo, dog, we're doing something amazing. It's amazing. These records is huge. You know what I'm saying? We performed at the White House. Like we, we you know, we doing big things. Like during 9-11, it was whole, they had all the firemen over here, the police over here, up on stage, waving the American flag. Like we at the White House. You know what I'm saying? We doing Z100 arenas. Hmm. You know, everybody on Z100 is not hip hop. You know yeah, what I'm saying? I tour with Britney Spears and Saint, like, you know what I'm saying? Like, I'm on Nickelodeon when Nick Cannon was on, you know what I'm saying? Like, so it's like everything that he said, you and that's the, I think the thing with Puff, regardless of where he may be in life or in his career, you do not want to not bet on him. You know what I'm saying? Man. I think anybody got any sense struggles with like, you don't want to not bet on him. Mm-hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because of what he accomplished. You know, you don't want to not not bet on him. You know what I'm saying? So, but yeah, I mean, I kind of outgrew that situation, which leads to the journey that I'm on now. So I saw a resurgence of street talk after you distanced yourself from Puff a little bit. It was like Mm -hmm. Jim Jones, you was, you were really talking. Oh yeah. I was in a bad place. I was in a bad place because one, everything that transpired all those nuances or issues that was coming up, they didn't have a single clue what just took place in my life and what I'm trying to establish for myself at this point. So- You mean as far as? As far as like, you know, just everything that, that took place at Bad Boy. Right, mm-hmm. gotcha. And me leaving, now I have to prove to myself in the world that I can do it on my own. Mm-hmm. Right. So the last thing I need is someone who just reached a point in their career, or whatever, getting a little spark and trying to use that, you know what I'm saying, to 
obstruct my path. Mm -hmm. And that's what I kind of think, you know, Jim was doing at the time. I think that at that time, because like, I ain't never had no problem with him. Like, I, don't, I ain't really know him. I ain't never grew up with him. We don't got no history at all in the street. How did it start? I don't even know how it started, to be honest with you. I was just as shocked when I seen Freeze put the joint out. He was talking about, he seen me like selling Boost mobile phones and stuff like that. I'm like, dude, bugging, like what's wrong with him? You know what I'm saying? Because I remember it clear as day. Like I was at Lenox Mall in Atlanta. I was cool with the vice president of Boost Mobile who was like trying to build the, the, the brand at the time. So what they asked of me is like, yo, you know, trying to build a company. We just want to get, you know, $5,000 a month for anybody to just rock the phone and the phone bills, whatever, do whatever. So I'm thinking like, you know, type of dude I am. I'm going to spread the love. I gave Kanye a phone. This was like then, like Kanye wasn't even Kanye quite yet. Yeah. Kanye mm -hmm. made like So I remember seeing Jim at Lennox Mall. I seen Chrissy. Chrissy known me from street, from all of them. You know right. what I'm saying? So seeing, oh, boom, what up, boom, boom. I'm like, yo, I should do it, right? Like, yeah, you know, let them know that, boom, boom, boom. I'm giving up the situation that I'm dealing with. Next thing I know, my like, yo, you know, your man was on freeze joint sub zero talking about like one more time. I'm like, so now I'm like, you know, that was, you know, that was that was an issue for me. Cause I'm like, dog, I don't even know you. You don't really know me like that. Me ain't got no history, no nothing, like nothing. Our paths never cross, you know what I'm saying? And you slandering me. Right. You know, it's like, okay, you got people to buy into whatever your movement, or whatever you trying to create for yourself, that's cool. You don't need to try to slander loom to solidify that. Because right. if it ain't a fluke, then what you do? You don't need me right. to propel your career. You don't need me, you know what I'm saying, or, or whatever you think transpired at that moment when it came down to them phones. Right. That was me just trying to introduce the guys I know to help someone else that I knew who was in an executive position at Boost Mobile. And it turned into a whole circus. And next thing I know, it's like, now I'm beefing with Dipset. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Not Cam, I never had an issue with Cam. I knew Cam before I knew anybody over there. Any of them, I've been knew Cam growing up. So why wasn't these situations stopped huh? immediately? You knew Cam. Well, that was the issue because I think that because of what they established as a group or a conglomerate or whatever you want to call it, I think that their loyalties didn't enable them to see like, this is an issue you don't need. It's going to be a lot of stuff that come with the path y'all on. Right. You know, why initiate something that, you know, is not conducive to no success or anything that you're trying to accomplish? Like, why yeah. why do that? And then yeah. I was kind of bitter at Cam because I felt like, you know, you know me better than all of these cats. Like, you know, and I remember I had a conversation with him. He was like, yo, these dudes is grown men. I can't tell them this, this, and that. All right, well, cool. Say no more. That's it. They grown men. That's how we gonna deal with it, you know? And that's basically what my head was. Like, whoever I see, whoever I get close to, or proximity, arm reach, whatever, I'm gonna try to deal with the situation accordingly, you know? <laughs> Since you know, this my man, yeah, you know, you tell right. me they ain't grown. Okay. You know? So that's basically like, you not getting involved. Well, right, you, you, st you staying out of it. And that's what it was, you know? So, you know. But you know, Allah is the best of planets because it's like, you know, I found something more, mm. you know, way more meaningful. Now I got to ask, did those situations kind of like help to push you in the other direction? Well, it definitely wasn't foreseeable, but I think that it sparked, you know, anger that I didn't have in a very long, long time. time. Because I felt like these are dudes that come from where I come from that really wasn't really out there like I was out there. They wasn't doing the stuff that I was doing. So just because y'all got some cats 
in other places in the states or whatever buying into your movement, you ain't never got to try to downplay what false perception a person may have of me. Right. Y'all know better. It's actually supposed to be cats like y'all that clarify whenever somebody get this wrong. But right. like, nah, not Loon. Not Loon ain't no green light. Like Loon, yeah. yeah. It's yeah. like people used to do for MC Hammer. You know what I'm saying? Right. Mm. You got cats that ain't even live in Oakland. Like, nah, not him. Nah. Him. Pfft. Yeah, leave him alone. Yeah, leave him alone. Right. You know? So I felt like, for me, that was more appropriate coming from them than they're trying to like, you know, forge some kind of presence in Harlem or whatever, or outside of Harlem, whatever. It's like I felt like that was just a it, it was it was a it was just a play that was just unnecessary. Right. Because they was gonna be successful anyway. Right. They had they had good music. They had a good thing going. It was good. And that little moment didn't benefit or contribute to it. Mm. So it was just senseless. Nobody started buying into Dipset because of that Sub Zero interview. Right. That just solidified that individual's character. That's your character. That's all you did. That's your character. But as far as what y'all established as a group, as a company, what was supposed to reach you was going to reach you anyway. You know? Right. And that's why I thought it was unnecessary slander to try to like, I don't know. But how close was this, this situation to Abu Dhabi? All right, so now when we get to um, where I became Muslim is that first of all, my album, when it came out, it debuted at number six. So if I have any recollection of most number one records, they'll debut at probably 22. And then next week, number one. Right. If I debut at number six, six. You, you just got to blow me. You yeah. ain't really got to, you know, I don't even need to push. Right. I just needed like a little, you know, but I didn't get that. You know, I didn't get that. Why? I mean, law knows best, but I didn't receive it. I didn't receive the support that would have easily propelled my career to where I felt at the time I deserved. You know, and because it didn't happen, that's when we split on amicable terms. So now I'm touring this stuff overseas and I can't find a single CD. Literally, I'm going to Tower Records in Germany. Up there. It's not a loom CD, nowhere to be found. Only DJs got 12 inches and they're selling them for $100. I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like, why is none of my stuff out here? So when people like the loom album only went gold, that's the only thing I shipped. Hmm. And this is under what label? It's under that one. The yeah, that's the only yeah. thing they got shipped. Because I did my own investigation by way of a tour. I'm, I'm out there. I'm outside. I'm going way overseas now. You know what I'm saying? Because, I mean, you know, the life expectancy of a record in the States at that time was like a couple months. You know? Yeah. Yeah. You know what I mean? If you ain't hitting the mixtape, keeping it light, keeping the fire lit. But overseas, they were loyal. It was a different type of fan base. Right. That a lot of artists over here didn't really have the opportunity to have. And I had that and I went and seen that there was no support. There was nothing, you know what I'm saying, being done to, you know, help my career. So Did you take this up with Puff? No, I had left at that time. Oh, you left so, yeah, at, I that left time. at that time. Right. Once I seen what took place, it was like, all right, I gotta go. Now I gotta go try to salvage. You know what I'm saying? I was on a salvage mission. And that's what led to me experiencing Islam. Because I'm out here on one mission, not even thinking about religion. Religion had nothing to do with my life at that point. I was on a diehard mission to just say, look, I'm going to prove to myself the whole world I, 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 I could do this. Meanwhile, I'm visiting Senegal. I'm out there at a show, a little you know, situation. I don't want to get into all the details, but when the smoke cleared, I went and visited Gory Island. Now, Gory Island was one of the first slave houses built in Senegal. Mm. So, when I seen how it was structured, they had a tour guide that was taking a bunch of like white people and showing them the stuff. It just looked like SeaWorld. I'm like, I don't, want, I don't think I want him to tell me what 
happened right here. But it was a guy just standing on the side, chilling, just like he is right now. And I approached him, like, you know everything that happened? He said, absolutely, I know everything that happened here. I said, well, wait till this dude get out the way, because I don't like the way, you know, this is like some Disney trip. He had a white button up. It just ain't look yeah. real. Right. And I don't want the real experience. This right. man looked like somebody who lived here, right. been here, generation after generation. So when he explained to me about the amount of slaves that passed through there, but then he told me about a portion of them that never left the soil. He said they fought and they died right here. Mm. So I'm like, what do you mean? He said they would not submit to no one other than Allah. Mm. Like, like every time I tell this story, it's, really, it's, it, it, it's, it's hard for me because it's like, yo, that's what stripped me from nationalism. Because you telling me that these people die for God it had nothing to do with the color of your skin. Or the they would not himself. submit to no one other than God. And he said nothing about no white man, no green man, no red man, no none of that. Right. They would not submit to no one other than God. And they fought and they died based on that belief. That, that here is. we are over here beefing about our skin. Yeah. And our ancestry is not that far-fetched. Mm. There's still some existence or remembrance of it that exists today in these countries. Right. And they can tell you a whole different story. Mm. You know what I'm saying? That has nothing to do with what we exhausting ourselves worrying about. So when he told me that, it immediately stripped a layer from me. Not that I discredit the first man that made the black man that made the shoe, the first black man that made the iron, the black man that made the street lights. You know, we, we, these were right. the things that we held on to because it gave us a sense of dignity, a sense of you know, belonging, right. a sense of purpose. Mm -hmm. But just that one statement removed the virtue of those things. Those were survival you know, contingencies that, you know, that came under the guise of surviving right. and thriving and surviving. You know what mm -hmm. I'm saying? But this story that he just told trumped all of that. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? For you. For me. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? For me. So I kind of logged that somewhere back here in, in a nice little part of my heart. Then I went to Kazakhstan. Me and Mario Wanda, we guests of the president of Kazakhstan. We did nine days. They done put together a whole makeshift militia to do our security. We run around the country like, you know, like ambassadors of the United States. This is the type of treatment we was getting, yeah. you know? So long story short, I remember one of the last shows we did, we was in backstage and then president guy came in. He was a young dude, you know? Cause it's funny when we first landed, they pulled up in the, um, in the AMG, hmm. me and Ben's joint. He had the G unit hat on backwards and all that. So I'm thinking they the welcome wagon. <laughs> this last show when he came in back, it was the same dude. Mm -hmm. Man, this is President Lou Sultan. I'm like, what? That's the same dude that looked like the dude that comes and tells right. you, like, Lou, I got the girls, I got the weed. Got yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Know, like right. that guy. Right. But this was him, you know what I'm saying? On right, a covert man. mission to <laughs> remove himself from his regal status and come down here. Yeah, you know what I'm shit, saying? Right. So when he came in the room, I remember I'm like, yo, let me ask you a question, right? <laughs> when you see somebody, how you say what's up? He like, salam alaikum. I'm like, that's what the Muslims say. You know what I'm saying? So for me, mm. that showed me another level of diversity I never seen. You from New York? You from New York, you from New York, you could probably count on three fingers. Yemeni, corner store, Pakistani, mm -hmm. pharmacy, West African, cab driver. That's all we know in New York. Right. You know what I'm saying? You ain't never like met no abundance of Palestinians and all that, you know, Egyptians. Where we just knew those demographics was frequent in our neighborhoods. Little Yemeni dude, right? Standing on a crate. He really mm -hmm. five three, but he got a crate behind his <laughs> right, 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 make it right. like you said. That's what we know, right? right? You go to pick up some medications, a Pakistani dude and your Indian dude. That's right. Muslim. Right. Right? West Cat the cab drivers, they all West African. Right. Gambian, Senegalese, you know what I'm saying? They got the Kofis on yeah. and they ride yeah. around all day. Yeah, pay me right. now. Asian dude in the liquor store. 
Asian dude in the liquor store. Not sure, not sure if he Chinese Muslim. Not sure if he Muslim. Yeah, right. You know what I'm saying? But we talking about identifying with Muslims to the best of our ability in New York City. Gotcha. So now I'm over here with descendants of Mongolians. They got Russian genetics. You know what I'm saying? Asian features. This is Kazakhstan, Middle right. Eastern Asia. This is Russia. He telling me they say Saddam Ali. So I'm baffled. Like, whoa. That's what the Muslims say. Right. You know, we Muslims. So now I done went through uh getting stripped from nationalism. Now I'm learning there's more diversity that comes with Islam. So the last trip was the UAE. And I remember the girl that was working with me, she booked the joint. She was like, yo, they want you to come out here to Dubai, Dubai, Abu Dhabi. And I remember what she told me, I was like, I ain't going out there. She said, what you mean? I'm like, I'm not going out there. Because in my mind, I'm thinking about the Yemeni dude that got the five-year-old picture on the you know, joint with the, with the AK. I'm not going to do no show with no kid five years old. <laughs> <laughs> he's got the AK, he's got the hook knife on his belt. <laughs> I'm not going nowhere. Right. You know what I'm saying? And she bidding off me because she knows something I don't know. So she keeps saying, you sure? Because they offer you this. I'm like, man, they can keep that money. Keep that money. You know? Right. So long story short, she finally convinced me, showed me some pictures, showed me. I'm like, nah, you bugging. I ain't, that's, that's for real. Yeah, I said, yeah, that's Dubai. Yeah. <laughs> and they had them. So in my mind, I'm like, but they don't look like the dudes that I see in the corner store. Oh. They joint lit, you know what I mean? Cause you see them dudes on the corner store in the news, right? They got the, 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 the they yeah. always showing pictures of them, mm -hmm. yeah. you know, right. concentration camp. They doing tux and rolls and, and all that. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So like, that's what I'm thinking. She booked. I'm right. not going out there to do that, <laughs> you know. So when I went out there, it was just like, it was mind blown. I'm like, these people got abundance of wealth that I would have never known. Mm. existed because I can't even get a loose cigarette or a discount on a box of pampers from the Yemeni in my block but it's like you know what I'm saying right. these dudes got money to burn so I remember when I did the show at Dubai and we drove to Abu Dhabi it's like a two and a half hour drive through the desert just dark no street lights no nothing just driving through the desert we got to Abu Dhabi and I was at the Emirates Palace Hotel so at the time I was like the only seven star hotel mm. in the world so, yeah, so I'm in that joint. I'm getting every buck, every buck of that joint. Cause you got a butler button. I used to press the button. You know, the button is just, you know, hey, how you doing? I'll get a toothbrush, you can join again. Can I get a toothpaste? My bad, I hit it by mistake. <laughs> 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 you, see, you, see, you know what I'm saying? When you think of for, for the amount of money right. that was spent for this joint, you never mm. forget where you come from. You know what I'm saying? So <laughs> right. I'm, in there, I'm getting the most of it. Right. I gotta hit everybody. I gotta put fingerprints on everything, everything. in this in joint here. before right. I leave. <laughs> so I remember when I came in and I opened the balcony and I looked off the balcony and I seen the sun rising over the Arabian Sea. And something mm. just clicked. Mm. At that mm. moment, everything else made sense. Senegal made sense. Kazakhstan made sense. It all came full circle. And I knew at that moment that I wanted to be Muslim. No one never talked to me about Islam. Nobody never invited me to a conference where Islam was being taught. No one never handed me a book. I never had no inclination to the religion of Islam. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. The statement the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi used to say, Man yahdi Allahu fala mudalala, when you live fala hadi Allah. Like, so whomsoever Allah chooses to guide, no one can lead them astray. For whomsoever Allah leads astray, no one can guide. So we know guidance comes from God. You know what I'm saying? Right. You can search all you want. If he doesn't place, you know, sincere intention in your heart and guide you to a path that leads to the truth. You know what I'm saying? Not something that feels good. Not mm. something that, you know, caters to your whims and desires. The truth, because sometimes the truth is against you. Mm -hmm. Sometimes the truth is exposing. Governs, you know your vulnerabilities, your weaknesses. It's exposing. And stuff. You know, that's the truth. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of us run from the truth. 
because the truth hurts. We know that. Sometimes the truth is literally against all your lowly pleasures. All the stuff you're accustomed to doing, you want to do, whatever the case may be, the truth contradicts that. Right. But I knew at that moment I wanted that truth because I've set out on a mission that all y'all understand. I'm just trying to, I'm trying to get what's mine. The intention. The intention was nowhere near that. But it was. But it was. You know what I'm saying? Because what I was searching for, I didn't even really know what I was searching for. I was only searching for what I understood, what was tangible. You know what I'm saying? But there was something more. To be strong enough to stand on your own. Yeah. So from that moment, I ran straight down to the lobby of the hotel. And the first Muslim I seen, I told him, yo, I want to be Muslim. He said, well, yeah. It was just, you know, it was awkward for him. Yeah, he was like, what do you mean? Yeah, nobody was like, yeah, he's like, what do you mean? What are you? <laughs> yeah, so I, 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 I said, I want to be Muslim. So said, listen, man, because you know how you got something. You didn't hit the bell for that one. Nah, <laughs> you know, I could have. You know what I'm saying? Where are you too much? That probably would have been. No, I won't be Muslim. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah, look, that probably would have been way more a benefit for the butler. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? Like abusing that privilege <laughs> right. to actually ask him for something more meaningful. Right. I didn't think about the button. But I knew right. that the lobby of that hotel was the Muslims everywhere. They were mm. always walking around with, with phobes on and stuff. You know, this is new to me. Culturally, it's new to me. But I right. knew that if I wanted to find one, I'd go ride down to the lobby. Right. The first one I found. So when I kept saying I want to be Muslim, he was just kind of like, what do you mean? Well, I, you know. So you know how you have something that's burning inside, you don't want to mm -hmm. lose it. You know what I'm saying? So the pressure I'm putting on him is to suffice what I'm dealing with. I need, I need rectification. I need like, this piece. Like right now. Right. Because I know this what it is. I know this what's this, right. you know, what this is. I wasn't exposed, exposed to nothing okay. else that meant anything to me on this journey. Right. You know what I'm saying? I was seeing a lot of things that I was being denied based on my initial intention. But what I'm receiving is something I wasn't even looking for. So he told me, I right, well, listen, you know, repeat after me. He told me, raise my right hand, you know, and I repeat after him. Ashadu in la ilaha illallah wa ashadu in the Muhammad Rasulullah. I bear witness that none has the right to be worshipped in truth except Allah. And I bear witness that Muhammad is the message of Allah. I repeated it. He said, Khalas, you Muslim. <laughs> Just like that. <laughs> Just like that. Shout and just that look, you just that statement, just that reaction was everything that was happening to me. Cause ain't nothing in life ever been that simple for me. Mm -hmm. After everything I've been through in my life, you know, minus a lot of details I might have left out mm -hmm. because I don't want to, you know, because I, I <clears throat> I've been forgiven for those things. You know what I'm saying? I've grown from those things. I've evolved from those things. I believe there's just putting emphasis on those transitional phases that led to this is way more important than the details. Right. But the reality of it is that everything that transpired in my life was never simple. Never simple. For my grandmother picking me up from my mother's house when I was only like three, maybe six months old. My mother left me in the house with some you know, people that was getting high or whatever. My grandmother raised me from that day on. The discrepancies of knowing who my father was and what, all of these things I went through. All the fights, the scuffles, the, the, the struggling with behavior, you know what I'm saying? Getting kicked out of every school I went to. You know, it was just I, it was just a nonstop, consistent pattern of complicated things that took place right. in my life. But, but there was already an establishment to but who you, you are. You don't know that at that moment. You don't know it in yeah. that moment. Yeah. But like listening to your story, when you heard about the slaves. Yeah. Said that they wouldn't bow to no one else but God. Yeah. You probably felt that way your whole life. You dig yeah, what I'm saying? But I never seen it implemented. Right. That's the thing. You know what I'm saying? It was always prosperity preaching. It was always something about something that dealt with our economic, you know what I'm saying, uh, uh, um, situation in our community. It was always to something. The bag. Yeah, it was always about that. Right. It was never about, and it's like, quite frankly, I don't think none of y'all. You know what I'm saying? Gonna smack butt at the strip club. I don't think I think all y'all are soft. You know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. That establishment and not to try to I'm not attacking nobody's faith. 
right. or beliefs. I'm just saying that when you look at implementation, but that's what we got. We look at what's tangible. We look at what we see. You know what I'm saying? So I've never seen that level of integrity being practiced. Only some individuals, maybe in a household, but as a collective, I never saw that. I never mm. seen that being a basis of why they exist, why you believe, why you strive, you, your, your, your willingness to defend that. Right. Mm. Never seen that. Never seen that. You know what I'm saying? So to learn that, like I said, that was powerful to me. Because we're not even thinking about God until we shot. You know what I'm saying? Or you can't pay the bills and light go out. Right. Or you slumped over a toilet, right? Drunk. Tomorrow, God, you let me get past this. I ain't gonna drink no more. What you do as soon as you, you know, as soon as you spare you? Go right back and drink, right? So this is the relationship that you have. It has to always be at some point of adversity where your hands is in the air. I done went through my roller days from A to Z. I called every dude I knew from eight, from Aaron, you know what I'm saying? <laughs> to my man Zoo. You know what I mean? Right. All else fell. Now I gotta go to the one I should have went to first. That's how it works for us. You know, this is hand down to us in our homes. Right. Because the average one of us, you ask us anything about anything legislated or textual, we don't know. You know? And if we challenge it, we get offended. Right? But we're not offended because we don't know. We offended because you 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 talk about the person that gave it to me. You trying to say my grandmother lie, you ready to roll up the steers and everything. <laughs> like you ain't defending your belief. Right. You're defending the one that gave it, gave to, it you. to you. Mm -hmm. Right. You trying to say my mother a liar? I ain't saying that. I'm saying maybe your mother was lied to. So you saying my grandma was a liar? Like you know, it, it, it goes into this whole, you know what I'm saying? It goes into this whole hype, right. heated debate about you defending something that was given to you, but you have no legislated yeah, proof, proof to support why you believe what you believe. You know so what I'm saying? Through, your, through all your trials and tribulations that you endured, at, at any time do you, do you remember you having those self talks like, yo, I need peace. I need peace. Absolutely. Like telling yourself that. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Now what and I what I was gonna say is that's how you attracted it. It came at a moment you wasn't expecting it, but through all of these journeys and yeah, your, your you intention. Through, yeah, you set that intention a long time ago. It's just when a lot was ready for you to take on it is when it appeared. Yeah, but see, that's what I'm saying. That's us trying to determine oh. something. Cause that, I mean, I'm being honest with yeah, you. Yeah, yeah. Like, a lot of wisdom is infinite. His ability to do whatever, you know. We can't fathom, you know, but we always as human beings because we need to. We need Try to make sense. Reason. Yeah, we, you know, we, got, we need reason. That's why most people are attracted to science. Mm -hmm. Because science leads something. to some kind of, you know what I'm saying? Right. It's all reason. Yeah. Right. And you need that. But then when science fails, faith is left. Faith is left. Right. You know what I'm saying? But if you can keep using science, you'll never accept faith. You know what I'm saying? That's how most atheists are scientists and stuff like mm -hmm. that. You know, if science can't prove it, they don't want to believe it. They're not going to believe it. So anyway, like I said, the simplicity of what just happened, the simplicity of what just happened was something that never happened in my life. Mm -hmm. I never received anything that simple. And I was so in shock that I literally told him, I said, nah, it can't be. I said, look, man, don't we got to go get the outfit now? You ain't got to give me no water. Now he looking at me like, nah, man, class, you Muslim. Yeah. And I'm just like, so I called the only Muslim I know. This is a funny part, right? My man, my man, I ain't gonna say his name because he used to sell guns and stuff. And Thought he was gonna say BBC. Nah, nah, nah. Because <laughs> Beans actually ain't become Muslim yet. I think I became Muslim before Beans. Hmm. Who I know best. But anyway, I called him. I'm like, Salam Lakum. Like, why you Salam? Who this? He's hard, bro. He's like, who this? I'm like, this is Loom. He said, Yo, you Muslim? I said, Yeah, I just took my shot. He said, Alhamdulillah. So I'll be talking. He's like, Yo, what's, what's all that noise in the back? I said, No, matter of fact, he was like, Yo, you sure you took a shot? He said, You sure? That's what he asked me. Are you sure? I said, Yeah. The man told me to say this. I said what he told me to say. I'm Muslim. Yeah. He's like, right, Look, man. You get back, you know, you get back to the States, man. Come see me, man. Take your heart again, man. Make sure. I'm like, what is <laughs> You know what I'm saying? I'm like, this dude is wild. You know what I'm saying? Right. This dude is wild. I'm like, yo, that's crazy, man. 
I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> that's what I'm trying to say. Like, I never talked to him at all about Islam. One time, I think I was coming to get something from him, and he was like, yo, you know, one day you're going to be Muslim. Man, shut up. I don't want to hear that, man. Let me see that say soon. I was just on that. Like, that's the one time he ever even uttered or made an attempt to even mention Islam around. Right. Because what we coming to do, that's what we coming to do. Now, I want to talk about your belief now, you know what I'm saying? Because he was one of them dudes, like, He's one of them dudes like to do it for minutes. Right. Man, mm. get your butt up off the cooler. Like, you know, what, what's he doing? <laughs> yeah. He was one of them dudes. Like, he would seize any opportunity to try to talk you about Islam. Right. So while he like going and showing me, like, yeah, you know, one day, yo, you want to say, man, I don't want to hear that. Right. Let me see that, John. So he was the only one I knew to call that looked like me that I could relate. I didn't know. He was, had the beard, pants over his ankles. Now, Philly, Philly got dudes that look like Muslim that's not Muslim. You know what I'm saying? Just yeah. Because of the influence that of Philadelphia, the Muslims have. Everyone. In the city. Yeah, everybody adapts. conforms to that. You right. know what I'm saying? So even with a lot of issues that take place in Philly, you know what I'm saying? It's hard to differentiate whether it's the Muslims involved or not. You know what I'm saying? Even though it gets perceived, in some cases it's factual. Right. But because the influence is so widespread, yeah. you know, even when I go to Philly, I don't even give people salams. I, I wait till they give me salams. I just, you know, you it's not like the ball Muslim, I ain't Muslim. Mm. Like yeah. that. You know what? From now on, I just wait for somebody to give me some so and I give it back. Right. That just mm. shows you the influence they had. So he was the only person I knew to call when I called him. I got back to the States. Lo and behold, I took Shahada again. <laughs> you know, I'm definitely like more Muslim than I thought I was. I had to take Shahada twice. <laughs> twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So how 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 devout are you? I know you study for a bunch of years. I know you speak fluent Arabic. I'm not fluent, but I can get around. You know what I'm saying? I that all fluent. sounded fluent to me just now. No, nah, that, that's just, I mean, I mean, because we pray five times a day and we recite from the Quran in every prayer. So even maybe the weakest of us, mm -hmm. we have to yeah. establish some form of language, you know, Arabic. Mm -hmm. Whether okay. it's reciting the Quran, whether it's greeting each other, whether it's short greeting or lengthy greeting, or you know whatever it is, some brothers get a little bit more extensive the more they learn, and so on and so forth. And the thing is, like you said, what was your question again? <laughs> I was asking how devout. Well, devout. That's why I'm, I'm sorry. That's something that we can't measure. You know what I'm saying? We can't measure how devout somebody is. To the practice. Not necessarily to the to the spiritual. Okay, let me Well No well, no not can, even pork. Can I no can I No can no I, I know what, I I know what you're saying. On. Yeah, got it, got it. Maybe you clarify. Um You're no longer able to listen to music. It's not correct? permissible for Muslims to listen to music. Right. And how are so many listening to music and making, that's making music? It. But that's the thing. We all have our strengths and our weaknesses. Okay. You know what I'm saying? His weakness, right? I may be stronger in that. But it may be something I'm struggling with that he might be better than it. Right. You know what I'm saying? And that's why you don't see a lot of judgment amongst the most. God, you know what I'm saying? Okay. Mm. Okay. Yeah. Not in competition. Yeah. Like, yeah. Have you thought about getting your tattoos removed? No. Because you can't inflict pain on yourself. So mm. these things took place prior to me becoming Muslim. Right. You know what I'm saying? So me entering the fold of Islam, at that point, I'm a newborn baby. You know? And in Islam, you're only held accountable for what you know. Mm. You know what I'm saying? And that loosens up some of that pressure we were talking about. We put on each other. It's like, if I didn't know better, you can't hold me account to something yeah. I didn't know. Right. Mm -hmm. And that's the mercy of the Lord. That's why Islam is a, a religion, you know, a knowledge-based religion. Because your faith increases the more you know. No. It's just like with a person. You don't enter a union with a person. Preferably a female, whatever it is. Right. Until you know more about them. Right. The more you know, the more you learn, the more inclined you become. You know what I'm saying? And that's how you truly establish a relationship with your creator. You got to know who he is. You got to know who he is, the first and foremost. The more you study, the more. Yeah. 
Yeah. And the more closer you get, relationships. Since you said relationships, like marriage. Are you doing that move? Are you having more than one? Years. That 28 years and counting. I mean, yeah. You've been married. I've been, I've been with my wife 28 years. We've been married for over 15 years. Can, can you have more than one? Yeah, it's my right. Okay. But there's conditions. Such as you, to you have same. to be equally fair oh. to both, which, which mean oh to both to both. Yeah. Okay, gotcha. You no, know, unfortunately, like you know, these type of conversations are taboo, not just for women but for men as well. Because I mean, men may look at it from you know a Rick James standpoint, like that's not it's not it's <laughs> yeah, not, that's not that. it. Yeah, not a Rick that. James yeah. standpoint. Really, I mean, because like, just to be honest, you know, mm. men look at it as if, you know, you can have an abundance of something that comes with a lot of responsibility. You know what I'm saying? Because Allah has made, he has given rights to every created thing. See, the way we live in society, everything is a tug of war for rights. You know what I'm saying? Seniority. Who gonna run the house? Who getting the most money? You know what I mean? You know, it's like these type of things cause discord in households. But if we understand each other's rights, and whenever we run into a, ro a, a bump in the road, we resort back to the source. So for example, like if you think about relationships, if your relationship is based upon lust, and you have a fallout, what do you resort to? Oh, you're actually asking me? Absolutely. Oh, my relationship is based on lust and you have a fallout. You're probably gonna hop back in the sack. Make up sex. Right. Because that's the source of your relationship. Right. It's built off lust. Mm -hmm. So whenever there's a disconnect, you have to revert back to the source, the source of it. Mm -hmm. If your relationship is based on wealth and you get tested with poverty, Back to you gotta go get the bread. By all means. By any point, means, yeah. yeah. At some point, you know, her tolerance or her patience is running thin. It's yeah. like right. you're forming a scene out of dead presidents, right? Right. Hmm. So when the source of your relationship is your religion, whenever you have an issue, you revert back to it. You know what I'm saying? Hmm. And there's no glue or adhesive stronger than that because. Your faith is based upon rights. Woman has rights, children have rights, husband has rights, everyone has rights, animals have rights. Even when we slaughter animals, we don't slaughter them in front of each other. That's how serious it's not, man. Mm. It's rights. So long as you can adhere to that, you can that, that's what you need to be a better father, a better husband, is to understand rights. Because we all freestyling, you know what I'm saying? We just trying to be better than you know, what we witnessed, mm. you know what I'm saying, right. what we saw. Right. You know, and that's our motivation. It's like, all right, dad wasn't ever around. I'm gonna always be around. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There's no blueprint. We ain't got no, no structure. Yeah. It's just yeah. like, yeah. we just, just trying to correct whatever. Correct, yeah. correct the last generation. That's it, that's it. But if you're looking at a generation that's been practicing this for over 1400 years, you know what I'm saying? And why you see such consistency in marriage and very small percentage of divorce. Mm. You know, you know, outside of Islam, we can't get it right. It's because of what the, the foundation of it. The foundation of it. It's based on something deeper than your ego. Yeah. I mean, look how many people just stay together just for the kids. Yeah. Miserable. A hate each other. Tons. Yeah. But we just trying to do right by them. Right. And the kids you. ain't stupid. No. Nah. Kids ain't stupid. And, and and if they do adapt <laughs> to that, they grow up and they have toxic relationships yeah. and they're not supposed to stay in. Is it hard for you to not... Is it hard for you to stay away from music? It's not hard for me to stay away from anything that brings pleasure to Allah. You got to remember what we're doing it for, right? Like Allah said in the Quran, He said, Man khalaq the jinn wa insa ila liya'budu. Right? But you're not flowing. <laughs> so, I did not bro. create men or jinn except that they, no jinn or men, except that they worship me. 
So Allah is telling us his purpose of why he creates. He created us for the purpose of worshiping him. That's your purpose. The purpose ain't to cut hair. Because if you lose both your hands, you can't commit suicide and say, I have nothing else to live for. I ain't got my hand, I can't cut hair. No, you still got a purpose. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's where the pressures of life come from, not understanding what your purpose is. That's the first thing everybody needs to understand. Why are you here? You know what I'm saying? Right. Doesn't matter what you survived or whatever the case may be. There's a reason why you're being preserved. There's a reason why these things take place in your life. Why are you here? Okay, now it gets established that I'm here to worship the one that created me. Because if he's the facilitator, arranger, originator of all of our affairs, he facilitates all our affairs, right? Rising, setting of the sun, moon, stars, precipitation. No man got nothing to do with this. So if he is the facilitator of all these affairs, then he's the only one that got the right to be worshipped. That's simplicity. I promise you that everything I've learned is simplicity. So now, this life is a trial for us. Mm -hmm. We're going to always be tested. But it's with purpose. Because there is a place in the hereafter that's been created for those that believe. So we want to live and die upon belief. You know what I'm saying? We don't have no attachments to the worldly life. That's why, like, well, like, what you see happening on this world stage when it comes to this, you see kids yeah. five years old throwing tanks, rocks at tanks. Tank. Like, it's not a game. You mm -hmm. know what I mean? It's not a game. This is willingness. It's no corruption, no pressure, no nothing. When you see women veiling and stuff like that, women, you know, in Western society automatically think she's being oppressed. Like, your husband making over noise. That's her, her choice. Because right. there's no compulsion in our religion. You can't compel somebody to be Muslim. Submission is a choice. When you choose to submit to God, that's your choice. I can't force you to submit. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, not to just, not to, you know, but the reality of it is, it's not hard. Mm. It was an easy trade for me. You know, I traded in. A lot of things that were replaced with things that were better, you know. Without music, I had the Quran. I listened to the Quran. I recite the Quran. I study the Book of Allah. It's the actual speech of God. Like reading it. Never been altered. Fourteen hundred years. You got hundreds of millions of Muslims that memorize the Quran. If I take the Torah, I take the Gospel. The, you know, the, the, the Zabur, the Psalms, the David, and take all of them and discard all of them. We'll be able to reproduce another Quran in hours. And y'all books will be lost forever. Pope don't memorize the Bible. He don't know that whole joint from front to back. T.D. Jakes don't know it. None of them. They don't know those books from front to back. You got seven, eight, nine, ten-year-old kids that memorize the whole Quran. Word for word verbatim. If you try to move one harakat or one you know, vowel or character, we'll know. Hmm. You know what I'm saying? That's why this is, this is, this is the fastest growing religion in the world. You know, mm -hmm. now we all are work in progress. Right. You know what I'm saying? So once you learn the reward from abstaining from things that's been prohibited, it becomes easy. Because it's just like if your wife told you, you know what I'm saying? Something that is contingent upon the longevity of your relationship. And she put this condition on you. If you love, appreciate, and honor your relationship with her, you want to stay far away from that, whatever that thing is. Right? Right. Ain't no slip up. You're a grown ass man. You know what I'm saying? She ain't gonna want to hear that just as much as you don't want to tell you, keep telling yourself that lie. You know what I'm saying? The reality of it is you knew better. You understood it. it. Wasn't a burden that was placed on you. It's just look, man, this is what you know this union entails. And if you cross this line or transgress beyond this, we done. I'm taking, I'm taking the kids and taking, you know, this is this is common enough. You know, when a woman tell you something like that, it's like, you know, only your pride, your ego tell you, you ain't running this. You ain't, you know. She running that moment. That moment right there, she's in yeah. full control. And she, full control. She, she's definitely going to follow through right. if you do X, Y, Z. Z. Yeah. yeah. You know what I mean? So, 
Yeah. My question to you, right, was how long after you took your shahada did you catch your case? Oh, three years later. Three years later. Yeah. And you did I'm glad that. you asked that because a lot of people think I became Muslim in prison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I was Muslim before I went to prison. Mm -hmm. yeah, I was living in Egypt before I went to prison. Right. You know, I studied a couple language schools. I went to, um, you know, um, Al Azhar University. I was, you know, studying the Rasul Khas and trying to, you know, further my education in Arabic language before I went to prison. And that was a good thing because when I went to prison, I became a benefit for a lot of the Muslims in prison. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Accepted Islam in prison, you know, and a lot of them struggle with separating the prison culture from Islam. You know, you got Islam, you got prison land. That's not, we, we, yeah, you know, yeah. Islam, you know what right. I'm saying? And honestly, that's what turns a lot of people from Islam. Because I know a lot of solid dudes that end up accepting Islam, you know, by Allah's permission, and me, you know, being patient and talking when they accepted Islam. Because they used to always tell me like that, man, I see how the Muslim be moving in this joint. I, I ain't gonna hold you, man. Sometimes your brothers be out of pocket. And I'm always making excuses for the Muslims. Like, you know, I, you know, come on, we ain't perfect. You know what I'm saying? We not perfect, man. You gotta understand, everybody in here is one phone call, one letter away from tick, tick, boom. So everybody deal with their problems different. Right. You know what I'm saying? But for those that choose to hold on to the religion and use that to navigate through these problems, they have the most success. But the ones that fall short and just feel like, you know, there's a substitute for it. I'm going to smoke K2, I'm going to drink some, you know, hooch, whatever. I'm going to play the ticket, whatever. Because you're getting the same stuff you get into on the street in prison. Right. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's it's definitely not. You, you already know. Yeah, it's not like surprise. National Geographic. They always show you just the, the wrong stuff in jail. Mm -hmm. They probably do that to make you don't want to go. But I ain't changed nothing. <laughs> 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 you, know, you always put that type of stuff out of me. You don't, don't want to go here. But yeah, you know, you've been, you know, you understand yeah, what no. it is. Man. I've seen, I've seen a lot of like, you know, discrepancies in there where you have uh, brothers come inside and you know they're of, of no faith, they never gang bang, nothing like that, but they did whatever they did in the street, and they decide to convert to Islam or or a gang or whatever the case may be. Some out of fear, some out of out of wanting to be accepted by something, and unfortunately, a lot of the experiences that I've seen in prison was brothers wanting to conform for protection yeah. in contrast to actually wanting to conform to better their lives. How do you feel about like that stigma with brothers coming in and wanting to do well, that? that stigma or, or just the action of it? The action of it is we don't control Allah's deen. We don't know what reside in the hearts of the individual. You know what I'm saying? Islam is 24-7, 7-11, it's open. 24 hours a day, seven days a week. You know what I'm saying? Person into the fold of Islam. We treat them as someone who sincerely, you know, into the religion. If Allah will, he's gonna humiliate him. You know what I'm saying? This hypocrisy, if there is any, will get exposed. It will happen. You don't have to look for it. Cause like you said, because actually it's funny, because I get calls from brothers in prison all the time, and brother called me, he was telling me about a situation where brothers was in like, you know, prepping to push on a brother. Because they felt like he was coming amongst the Muslims for protection. And then once the smoke clear, he like back at it again. Mm. But I'm like, look, as long as he ascribed himself to being Muslim, he ascribed himself to his religion, his blood, his wealth, and his honor is sacred. You know what I'm saying? And he's right to go to the Muslims for protection. Mm -hmm. That's where the Prislam come in. Because it's like, you know, you're trying to play the same card that Crips or the Bloods or the GDs, that's, mm -hmm. that's the game they play, you know? Right. And it's not sustainable. Mm -hmm. I've been in dropout yards where it's like a yard where everybody that can't function as a gangbanger no more, they drop out and they get, they get sent to this yard where they could just, you know, be free of that, right. you know? Mm -hmm. But the thing is, like I said, that's not sustainable. You can't put that kind of pressure on a person force him to conform to whatever it is y'all code is and all this, this and that. But with the Muslim, he's like, look, man, I'm weak, man, that's your brother. Because if it was your brother, like your blood brother, you know how much patience we have for the drunk uncle, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. your, 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 your disloyal brother, your, 
smart mouth cousin. Like we got all the patience in the world for our bloodline, you know. Right. But you talking about a brotherhood that's forged by, you know, what I'm saying that's established through God. Mm. I honor that more than my own. Like my brother that comes from my mother's womb, mm. you know. He not Muslim, but I'm, you know, I love my brother. I do anything and everything for him. But if I had to choose between him and a Muslim, I'll, I'll choose the Muslim. Why? Because the Muslim got more rights over me than my brother. He got more rights. I've seen that too, my cousin. Yeah, it's real. Yeah. You can't forge yeah. that. It gets, it gets a little sticky. Yeah. But yeah, you know. No. Now we could, we could keep going. <laughs> <laughs> Was that other bracket with the um? No, no, now I gotta ask. Uh, uh, how do you feel about people questioning you about hip hop? Like In I said, opinion. it's the same thing with Loom. It's like I look at that's what people identify with. Right. I had this. I had the same situation with Dame. Dame, my man. And I came home, I hung out with Dame. And you'll see, like you know. Footage of that conversation, like Dane was going through it, like yo, dog, like you know, periodically just kept like, I can't believe, like yo, he's like, you know, it was, it was hard for him, and yeah. I'm looking at him like, and he just like, yo, you dead serious? I'm yeah. like, yo, I'm dead serious, bro. I'm done, you know, I'm done, and it's like, that just shows me that people appreciate what I did, yeah. you know what I'm saying? Because they see the contract, yeah, but it's yeah. not enough to persuade me. It's just enough for me to identify with, like, you really appreciated what I did, you know, and from what I hear, I ain't even trying to be funny, but from what I hear, like I said, I don't listen to music, but I've heard people tell me straight up, like, well, man, you need to come back out, man, because this stuff these cats doing right now, <laughs> <laughs> I be hearing it, you know, just, you know what I'm saying, like yeah. I said, I'm not saying that to offend nobody or nothing. Right. No, you can be offensive. You, you know what I'm saying? No, nah, but the reality of it is, like when I'm in barber shops, it was the same thing like in prison. I'd be in a barber shop, you know, some of the dudes be having their radios and stuff playing. Yeah, you know, I try to, you know, chime in, like, who that? Oh, that's <laughs> that's a little such and such. Oh, that's a little, that's a little. I heard so many Lil's, I'm like, yo. And I asked the barber what's how I asked. I said, how you can tell the difference? Difference. Because I'm I, I'm an ex-artist. Right. My ears ain't dead. You right. know what I'm saying? I just don't have the inclination, but I'm listening, I'm like. But he sounds just like the other, other dude. dude. Yeah. You're like, yo, that's what they're doing. Yeah. It's you know? amazing that you can keep yourself. I, I, we all sitting in this room, watch you talk about music and watch you talk about writing these songs and the smile that comes on your face and the happiness that you get just talking about it. It's insane to think that that's something you're not allowed to do anymore. Well, I'm smiling because I escaped. Damn. Okay, I'm quiet. I'm smiling because I escaped. You know what I'm saying? Right. You ain't gonna convince him, bro. Nah, no, I'm just saying, I'm like, think quiet. About it. I'm quiet. Yeah, I'm smiling because I escaped. But you can still give an opinion so, on. Yeah, because I, right. I gotta ask. Uh, BT has this bracket for the greatest rap crew of all time. You can go vote bt.com slash MEO. And um, it's down to the last four. Yeah. It's East Coast, uh, Midwest, uh, South. And West Coast. Mm -hmm. Just give me your take on who's gonna, who do you think is gonna win between the two brackets, and who you think is gonna win overall. So, so when you say so crew, let me be crew. clear. The criteria is all messed up. Look, it's that we yeah. we can't we, we can't this argue game. these things. They pick these people as crews. That's that's what it is. Shout out to BT. Yo, Sam, you still gotta come up here. and We gotta talk some. You know what I mean? <laughs> um, it's like labels, crews, groups. You got, uh, like you got YMCMB versus Death Row. Death Row first. So oh. YMCMB is Lil Wayne, Drake, Nicki Young, Nas, Money, Cash Money, and you know Death Row is already. I mean, Crazy. my vote ain't gonna count. But I'm just saying, <clears throat> if I had like crews. Yeah, if you had to choose between those two. Pick put your own criteria to it. I'm gonna have to, because I don't understand yeah. I don't understand the significance of a crew in regards to hip hop. Right. Mm. 
Yeah. More, more, more like uh, the significance. Mm. Well, I mean, there's there's significance. I mean, like, like you the have heart. artists, right? Who the crew? No talent and got no investment in the business. Oh no, Made not, oh, no, more not, noise. Not, not that not type that, of crew. Not that. More That's like what I'm trying to say. let's you let's say like understand. let's say Harlem World. Everybody got to drop an individual album and continue to have solo success. All right, let me but, just let me just put this to sleep. Mm -hmm. I would say Wu Tang. Out of everything, I didn't even name yeah, Wu Tang. Yeah, yeah I'm gonna say Wu Tang. Wu Tang, yeah. top period. Top. Because Wu Tang's also in another bracket versus yeah, good, good music. Good music, right versus now. Good music. It's Wu Tang versus yeah. good. Good music. It's Wu Tang. Wu Tang. Yeah. Wow. All, all, all the way through all Wu Tang. Wow. All across the board because I think. And this is significant to my time being in the business. Right. I don't think that no one showed us how to milk the cow <laughs> like Wu Tang. From New right. York. Milk. No, period. I'm yeah. talking about milk. Mm -hmm. The so business. Everybody. They come had out as so a group. many subsidiary branches, and I mean, it's ridiculous. ridiculous. It's right. ridiculous, and still to this day, I watched the documentary. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, um, the series. The yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's still going on. It hasn't stopped. Mm. It's all of those other <laughs> names you name, you know, not to discredit any of them, they all achieved some great things. I'm certain, because I didn't, I wasn't able to catch Drake's career. I've just seen the accolades. I've seen, you know, the success that come from, but I haven't been able to. I wasn't listening to music at the time. Right. You know, I knew Lil Wayne personally before a lot of that stuff. I never witnessed the Nicki Minaj career because I wasn't, you know, around for that. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I knew Kanye back when his beats was $500 a pop. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> right. So it's like, for me, if I thought about the most sustainable crew, ever exist in hip hop period. You're not gonna find another group like Wu Tang. That stayed down. <laughs> like Wu Tang. Despite whatever indifferences. And I ain't saying that because you know Raekwon's Muslim, Ghost is Muslim, like I talk to them on the regular, you know what I'm right. saying? And but just that was just it's nothing been achieved. East or West. What was the life span of Death Row? Good seven, solid, seven, eight years. Five, I'd say five to seven. Like seven, eight years. If you take every, every, probably like a good. Yeah. Nah, maybe less than that. Nah, less than that. Maybe bro. less than that. Maybe like less than that. I think like, you're including NWA in this. Nah, I'm about to bring no, them no. down. You said let's say less than that. Whatever. Let's give them. Let's give them five. I don't know. Let's just give Death Row five. I don't know what you were talking about. Shout out to Shug. I spoke to Shug a couple of days ago, too. Like, mm -hmm. So, say like five years. Like, who else you said it in there? And who? YM. YMCMB. YMCMB. That's, what, that's Wayne. Wayne. How many Nikki. years? Drake's on year 10. Yeah, he's on year 10, so that's yeah. that's so, 10. So is Nikki about. Crew. Wayne. Crew. Wayne is longer than that. Lil Wayne is homeless. Jesus Christ. Christ. He was waiting for it, bro. He was waiting for it. <laughs> Wayne's <laughs> music career <laughs> has gone on. Uh, Wayne's music career might be over two decades. Yeah, twenty, yeah, 20 plus. They wasn't a crew yet. Right. Wayne had Young money part of it. Wayne, 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 Wayne had a career before that, that crew. Hot boy. I'm right. saying the crew. The that crew. crew. Yeah, there's nobody. So like, you the crew to, has to start with Drake. Had, the and crew Nikki. had to be with Drake. No, that's right. YMCNB. We we get into this every Young, week. But, but but young money, cash money. That's the whole. Right. But oh, that's, that's what I that's, that's, count. Yeah. YMCNB is what's what I mean. listed on the bracket. YMCNB. But that's, but that's young money. Period. Yeah, but why would they put young money before cash money? That's the name saying. of the YMCNB. But it's not involving necessarily nah, saying cash right, money if, is a if, part if of it. If they if if they deem again the criteria is all screwed. So if that's not if that's not included, yeah. it's not included. Right, right, so look, look at it. This is my point. This is my that. point. Yeah. I'm trying to Many get fresh. to. This is my what? point. I'm trying to get to. If you sense. take death row and add YMCNB, you still ain't got enough in. To compete 
Wu-Tang. 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 Wu is like good music. How many years? Crew. Mm. And I, and I hope everybody just that's know I'm not cool. going through this formality. Nah, cool. that's that's right. Right. Like a hot, I'm just good, trying good to music make is, sense. Good music like a hot is Kanye. Four years with good music. Good music is Kanye. Future. Two no, I'm, I'm just no. counting career. Like Kanye's second album is when, when did he start. No, good. No, music, when good. did he start shouting out good music? He been shouting it. No, out. Well, as the Get as, out of, as a crew, as a crew. Taylor. Two chains. Dog, it was Push around before them. It was Push around. It, it was around before them. Oh, you talking about with consequence? You, I'm, that's why I'm. He's asking like, when it started. Consequence. Saha the Prince. Uh, GL, GL. GLE. Yeah, those those cats from the first album. Yeah, but compared to yeah, Wu-Tang, see, this is really like, turning in barbershop talk. Look, I'm going with Wu Tang. <laughs> 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 I'm going with Wu Tang, man. I'm going Wu Tang. Wu Tang, Wu Tang. Yeah. Wu Tang for Listen, man. I'm going with Wu Tang. Look. That's probably the best answer I heard <laughs> coming out of anybody in here. Wu Tang's definitely going to take it. Um, y'all just need to go vote. That's it. Go to bt.com slash MEO and vote for Wu Tang. That's it. You don't have to vote for nothing else. Just vote for Wu Tang. I'm leaving it at that. I'm leaving it at that. Y'all can vote for you if you want to, of an, course. That's an endorsement. Yeah, hell yeah. I like yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a, that's a strong push right there. They're not listening to music, but he knows um, it when he hears it. Yeah. You got the documentary coming out? Documentary. It's going to be a six-part doc series. Mm. Also got a book. Um, my company, Paid Mills. It's a mobile application that, you know, I will be knocking on all of my previous well-established friends. <laughs> <laughs> you know, right. To help me raise the funds to build the app and impact food insecurity. Mm. You know, utilizing technology. Right. Like Pay Mills to me is a flagship. Is you know, my story and being able to tell that gives me closure to a chapter in my life where I can move forward into where I'm going in the entrepreneurial space. You know, and that's why I like when people ask me certain things like this, I can't grow to this next phase in my life unless I, you know, accept and let go of, of you know, what preceded. Right. So with paid meals, you know, people have been seeing me manually implement one of the functionalities of the app. But it's a mobile app that enables contributors to purchase meals for people in need through registered paid meals vendors. You know what I'm saying? So what we created is an ecosystem that impacts food insecurity within the problem. But you know you have United Nations and major organizations promising, you know, to obliterate hunger and stuff like that. Yeah, but we don't see it. You don't see it as one thing, but they do have the ability to amass the food required, but logistically they won't be able to implement. I mean, they won't. A little they won't be able to um, logistically. They won't be able to. A um, little monster. No, no, no. They won't Where be was able. It? it was up here. Like, right, where are you pointing? Where are you going? You can't go. <laughs> What are y'all? What? Hey, 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 relax. <laughs> Smaller than y'all. Yeah, you should have kept that to yourself. <laughs> I bet. Oh, man. What is this? Do mice have rights in Islam? Yes, they do. Uh, yes, they do. And in Yoruba. Yeah. yeah. So, um, right, so we, we, we can't do them dirty while, yeah. Yeah. while the brothers are here. Yeah, yeah. Y'all gotta sweep them out into the street. I take care of it. But, uh, I used to talk Yeah, so let me, yeah, 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 yeah just come yeah, on. So let's, let me finish, right? Yeah. So, Basically, they would be able to amass the food, but they won't be able to distribute it. Because <laughs> mm. 40% of it logistically will go sour. Mm. They haven't figured that out. You know what I'm saying? Mm-hmm. So, not to disclose so much, but the reality of it is, what happened? Not a damn thing. Yeah, we created you know, a platform, a mobile application that will be able to do just that. And I know with the support 
because uh, I, you know, I've been, I just been working. I just been working, you know, doing, you know, my best to, you know, raise funds, feed people, and I fed, you know, orphans in Uganda during Ramadan. You right. know what I'm saying? Over 300 people for the whole 30 days, you know what I'm saying? Ramadan, Bangladesh, you know, I've, last year I did Addis Ababa in Ethiopia. Like, I've fed major cities in America, a thousand people in Skid Row, and it's like, I'm not saying this to definitely glorify any of these deeds is just to show my commitment and the transparency. Cause like, if you ever follow me on Instagram, I always show from inception, from the purchase of raw materials to the food being cooked, being packaged and allocated by my hand. So mm -hmm. people know, cause it's the same mentality I had in the street. Give me something, you know what I'm saying? I'm gonna try to do right by that, you know? I think that's what the answer what you were saying is like you don't see it. Because you have 1.5 million nonprofit organizations in the United States of America. And it gross about 2.9 trillion a year. Damn. So when you think about that, it shouldn't be a single hungry starving, person. hungry, right. you know, individual, individual person, human in this country. Right. In this country. You know what I'm saying? We don't even have a billion people, right, in America. No. We don't. Mm -mm. But with 2.9 trillion, everybody should everybody be. Everybody should be. Yeah. So, like you said, you don't see it. Right. So my thing is, the paid meals is transparency, right? Feeding people stuff that I would eat. Mm. Major key. You know what I'm saying? Very important because I think that. We've given a certain type of classification for homeless people that we distribute staple meals, brown bag with grease at the bottom, like a like you know just yeah, you so treat nasty. them inhumane, spam shit like under that. the guise that Since you're trying to, you know what I'm saying? When all of them don't have the same story, some of them may have been there because of bad choices, drug addiction, mental illness, or whatever the case may be. But some people had bad day at the stock market. Some people are homeless today because of the pandemic. There's a lot of people who slipped into the state of homelessness or food insecurity. But yeah. people confuse the two. You know what I'm saying? Homelessness is evidence, clear. You know what that is. Right. But food insecurity, and as a matter of fact, I didn't even say that because people don't know that homelessness is not completely clear. But you know, you got the kid that lives in three, four different relatives' house. Right. You no, know, he stayed at his aunt's house. Leon coming over on Thursday, you gotta get out, go to your grandmother's house, right? Grandmother gonna play bingo on Sunday, you gotta go to your cousin's house. That's homeless. Right. You know what I'm saying? That's like a nomad. Even though it's under the roof of family members, but it's not. He doesn't stable. have one. Mm -hmm. right. You know what I'm saying? Food insecurity, you open your fridge after you know, putting in 40 hours or whatever the case may be. And you still got a whole empty shelf. That's food insecurity. When you gotta knock on somebody's door, bar butter, but you gotta go over here, that's food insecurity. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? So I just wanted to clarify those things because this is something that I'm passionate about. You know? And then of course, you know, prison reform. You know? My oh, man. You know, I don't believe in reform, you know, because the criminal justice system is put in place exactly the way it's supposed to be. Right. You can't reform something like that. You know, you have to dismantle it and rebuild it. Right. You know, you can't reform something like that. I don't really believe in continuously trying to forge laws that supposed to implement change because the enforcers of those laws, as long as you don't like me, the laws are not going to benefit me. You know what I'm saying? Court is being held in the street. It's being held in the street. At some point, you know, with all of these, you know, incidents with police killing unarmed, you know what I'm saying, black men, it's like, yo, what's the sense of having a judge? Hmm. You know what I'm saying? What's the sense of having a courtroom if I'm not gonna make it? Right. You know what I mean? So those things trouble me a lot. You know, and then I think after experiencing being in prison, 
you learn a lot about the prison system that none of us is exempt from being swallowed up in it. Mm -hmm. I got a 14 year sentence for hearsay and ghost dope. Hearsay. Hearsay. And drugs that don't exist. But because I had two prior convictions, they threatened me with two 851 enhancements. So my case alone started off at 10 years of life. The first prior enhances me to 20 to life. The second prior enhances me to mandatory life. You go to trial and try to beat that. You know what I'm saying? With the government, they got a 98% conviction rate. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And that's yeah. something that's, you know, destroying us. It's destroying yeah. our communities. I've seen kids coming through prison, these young boys, and they trying to like wear these sentences like they kingpins or something. It's sad. But you ain't never had more than $10,000 in one setting. You don't deserve a leadership role. You're not the head of an ongoing conspiracy or criminal organization. Because the real dudes that do that stuff, they got release dates. You ain't about to get one. Mm. And you shouldn't be parading around the prison like you know or you know, you see it in now. We doing the Instagram dudes is sending pictures and like you happy to be there? Yeah. <laughs> you know? But I even said the same thing to him with no disrespect. His 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 yeah, what yeah. he evolved to with the day, that's a blessing. But when he told me how many times you know how many beds he did what I said? I said, damn, you hard at it. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And I wasn't you know, being fact. disrespectful. I just, I'm not, I'm not going back if I can help it. You know what I'm saying? You know, if a law wills, I don't have no intention. I'm not involved in nothing. I wasn't involved in nothing then. You know what I'm saying? But it's like, that's not a place for a human being. That's not a place, you know what I'm saying? To continuously warehousing men and leaving these young boys out here, you know, being raised by single mothers and not being raised at all, being mm -hmm. raised by the very system that you know destroy their family or their household. So yeah. these are the things that I'm passionate about, and I think that you know, I want to thank you, you know, before we leave, just to let you know, like, I appreciate you allowing me, you know, to use your platform. Not only just to tell my story and have some genuine, you know, grown man conversations, but I think in conclusion, it should be understood that, you know, we all invested in things that's greater than ourselves. And I think that we need to put more emphasis on those things. Right. You know what I'm saying? Because I think that's what affects the youth, not just seeing the vehicle, but the destination, you know what I'm saying, where the vehicle is going. Cause that's direction, that's guidance, you know what I'm saying? But just seeing the vehicle, it's like, you know, kid walk by and see a car sitting there parked, it looking nice, you know what I'm saying? But where the car going is way more intriguing, you know what I'm saying? Uh, and I think that, you know, and I just say that to remind myself, you know, cause I'm working also on the podcast, me and my boy in DC, we have a podcast called The Perspective. Wow. And I'm definitely gonna, you know, return the favor. Oh yeah, whenever you're ready. I would definitely love for you to come. Whatever you want. the show. Yeah. And give you a perspective. And I know you got one. We all got one. But it's interesting when you can have thought provoking conversations about things that we may agree upon or disagree upon. But that's another lesson for you to see that we can actually do that. Mm -hmm. I think the conversation walk. itself yeah. is on. Um, we can walk out that room and still coexist. Right. With no discrepancy, no animosity, no nothing. You know, Cause that, that's something that I don't think they see is even Enough. possible. Right. You know, it's like shoot first. You don't, you don't see that in the movies. Nah, not at all. Yeah. yeah Let's definitely. make a new movie. Let's write a new script. Right. And as far as thanks for you being on the platform, it was God's will. I agree. I agree. We definitely I'm here. <laughs> Amir, <laughs> aka Louis. Tap in, find out everything you can find out about um, paid mi meals. Paid yep. meals. Yeah. I'm on book. Instagram at Real Loon to Amir. Same thing with Facebook. Also, we got the paid meals page. You know, be on the lookout for the documentary Life After Loon. 
mm-hmm. know what I'm saying? The book from Harlem to the Harlem. Mm. And um Oh yeah, the Perspective Podcast with my co-host, man, DC Harris. I know a lot of y'all never really hear my boy talk or really like, you know, I think it's gonna be a blast for people to see that, you know, he's somebody that we have a lot of commonalities, you know. Right. You know, we both born and raised in Harlem, we both been in the streets, we both, you know, did federal bid, we both got families. Right. Only difference is I'm Muslim, he's not. And I think that people are gonna enjoy seeing us exercise those commonalities. And in some cases, we may have our disagreements based on the things we don't have in common, right. or the one thing we don't have in common. But we have so many commonalities, it really sustains, you know what I'm saying, the, uh, the pace of the show. And, you know, Y'all like yourself. Y'all playing handball at any point? Oh yeah, yeah, nah, we playing handball the other day, man. Shout out to my man. He, he definitely fell one of the most eloquent ways to wiggle out of a workout. You know what I'm saying? You started off, you got that burn. Lil Mendes, he was working out with us too. His whole facial expression changed. You know, yeah. he wanted to take me and play basketball. Pops wanted to play handball. I'm like, we supposed to be doing pull-ups, but, push-ups, and dips. But, you know, but, you know he, yeah. he definitely get in there. He go to the gym every day. But, you know, like I told you too, I'm saying on camera, like, you know, we're going to put that pain in. All right, let's get it. Yeah. Let's get it. You let that ride to I'm in the hood with the work you heard. Making fiends leave earth, you heard. Got your baby mama thirst, you heard. Feel the flow, nigga, throw it in reverse. This the way you need to surf, you heard.